Okay, let's start. Uh, good morning um, and welcome to this uh, first edition of ICSAC, a uh, workshop uh, dedicated to cybersecurity for industrial infrastructures uh, that support uh, collaborative manufacturing. Uh, this year, ICSAC is hosted by HIPIC. Um, so we are very thankful for the very very well done organization by HIPIC this year uh, and the support. Uh, this um, workshop this year is also supported by Collapse, which is a um, European, uh, European funded project under the ICT8 call. Um, uh, so we will be presenting um, uh, Collapse uh, say challenges, uh, use cases and results. Uh, my name is uh, Valerio Senni. I am a uh, discipline leader of cybersecurity in the Research Center of Raytheon Technologies. Uh, it's an international um, aerospace and defense company. And I'd be happy now to pass uh, the token to my co-chair, co-chair of this workshop, uh, Martin. Please, uh, Martin, uh, feel free to continue. Thanks, Valerio. And Valerio, if I may ask when you already go to the agenda, because then I can give everyone a brief overview about the first part of today's uh, workshop. So we will start, um, or we will have several sessions today, and we will start with a keynote uh, on collapse given by session Kudic, so right after we start. And then we will have first an industrial panel with invited presentations, one given by Professor Ekbert Jan Sol from TNO, so an um, organization for applied science in the Netherlands. And Professor Sol has a strong background in industrial IoT, and he's also engaged in multiple organizations like AFRA, and will give us an overview about industry 4.0 initiatives in Europe. And that will be uh, then followed up by Aaron Wood from Side of Philips, also a partner within Collapse. And he will also follow up by giving a presentation on industry 4.0 requirements from the point of view of end users. After a short break, so we will have just a few short breaks in between, but after a short break, we will then have a deep dive into collapse technologies. And uh, that means that the different streams and work packages, um, development uh, work package, so to say, of collapse will be presented. And then brought together by one um, presentation who shows um, this is about the MVP plans and the objectives given by Dimitri, how that fits together in the overall collapse framework and how that will be used um, by collapse pilots is then uh, shown in the end by Valeria. And maybe Valeria, I'll hand back to you, then we can complete with the overview of what happens in the last sessions of today's workshop. Thanks a lot, Martin. The last two uh, slots will be first one uh, and invited the speech from uh, Sequoia. It's uh, um, a pro uh, our twin project. So the other project awarded under ICT8 will be very interesting to share uh, what they'll be doing. Uh, and the last part is um, will be a little bit more interactive session with polls about your feedbacks and directions in this uh, domain of cybersecurity for uh, industrial manufacturing. So stay with us uh, until the end, there will be, uh, will be an opportunity to share your, your thoughts. So um, Serjan, I'll be happy to uh, give you the, the floor here. Thanks. Okay, thank you. I'm trying to share my screen. You should see my screen now. Okay. Uh, my name is uh, Sergej Skrivic. I am a professor of computer science at the University of Novi Sad, but here in, in the COOPS project, I'm a, a right now scientific and technical coordinator. So my, my presentation will be an overview of COLAPS project. It's one of those Horizon 2020 projects that rec received funding 
in the research and innovation action, research, research and innovation program of the EU. Uh, okay, so, so collapse. Uh, let me just try to organize my screen here. Yeah. Collapse is a, a comprehensive cyber intelligence framework for resilient collaborative manufacturing systems. That's the full title uh, of the project. And this abbreviation fits well uh, to, to the scope of the project, which is collaborative manufacturing. Uh, you can see at the bottom of the screen, you can see a project website. So it's collapse-project.eu, not collapse.eu, that's something else. And you can also see LinkedIn page of the project. There's also Facebook and Twitter page, but I think this LinkedIn page is, is the most active. Okay, so <clears throat> let's then start with, with the overview. Uh, there's a lot of information in this slide. I will start with the consortium. So our consortium uh, has 13 partners. You can see their logos here at the bottom of the slide. Uh, three partners at the left side are use case providers. Yeah, so companies, Renault, Pratt & Whitney, or it says Raytheon Technologies here. You see the, the logo is almost the same. So Raytheon Technologies and Philips. Uh, and the others, you can see them here. Uh, some of them uh, from IT industries, some of them from academy like us. Uh, there was Siemens and so on. So 13, 13 partners. Okay, I, I mentioned that uh, the scope of the project is collaborative manufacturing. So you can see some illustration here at the left side of the of, of this slide. Uh, this is an overview, so we won't go into too much details, uh, but we can see two segments of, of this picture. One of them is digital manufacturing infrastructure. So what happens within the factory, but also supply chains. So that's something that happens outside, outside the factory. So that's what, what we call uh, collaborative manufacturing uh, I don't know, scope here with, within this product. So Collapse uh, is building, plans to build and is, is building comprehensive cybersecurity framework for such collaborative manufacturing uh, schemes. And here uh, in this mid part of the slide, you can see four what we call collaborative manufacturing elements. Uh, so the, those are some, some maybe topics that, that should be covered with, with this framework and they will map, I mean, they map well to the use cases of the project. Actually, we have three use case providers. Uh, so we have three use cases and some scenarios within those use cases. I will present them later, uh, but they will map well to, to these collaborative manufacturing, uh, manufacturing elements, unified data sharing. So that's the first thing to share the data, then data protection, uh, to protect the data. And then the other two deal with threats. So the first one is threat protection, monitoring and prevention. And the other is when the attack happens, so to, to detect it and to mitigate the consequences and to, to offer some kind of a response to an attacked, attack that, that happened. Uh, in the first six months, we devised the architecture of the system. You can see a small, small figure here in the, at the right side, but we will see, we will also go into some details of this uh, architecture. 
so this architecture con contains, I think, 17 components. You can see those components here uh, that when they work together, they fulfill those, <clears throat> those requirements that I just mentioned. Okay. So let's begin a, a bit, bit deeper uh, into the re requirements, use cases, uh, uh, scenarios uh, that have been defined. So th three use cases, since we have three use case providers, Raytheon from uh, aerospace industry, Philips, consumer electronics, and Renault, you know, is automotive industry, car manufacturer. Let's, uh, so th those are use cases and with, within them, we define some scenarios. You can see scenarios here. It looks like there are nine scenarios, but some of them are shared. So let's go to them uh, because I think they will illustrate well uh, what we're trying to accomplish within the project. So secure remote maintenance. Uh, this one is shared between actually Raytheon and, and Renault. You see number one, secure remote re uh, maintenance here and here in, in Renault. Uh, then secure data sharing, number two uh, with Raytheon Technologies, but also uh, with Philips, secure data sharing, secure cloud-based data and analytics. We have here, we have it also here in with Renault. Philips has shop floor threat detection and prevention scenario. And Renault has two scenarios of its own, asset management and threat detection and prevention. And the fourth one is very interesting to me, securing connected devices. So those devices are IoT devices, uh, more at, at the edge. <clears throat> I think we, we will uh, tackle that, that story again when, when we go to, to the components of the architecture. <clears throat> okay, so those are the requirements. Uh, let's let's now uh, well try try to go to the architecture, but but uh, not to the details of of individual components. We will have these presentations later uh, when we will see what happened within <clears throat> the work packages. Some of the components are uh, up and running, working, uh, integrated. So, uh, the others are running, but not integrated. And there are some that are not, not running still since we, are, we just finished the first year, first year of the project. <clears throat> I already mentioned collaborative manufacturing elements. So they're here in the right bottom corner. And they're marked here in this architecture figure by colors. Uh, since we have three dimensions of architecture, we had to do it like that. It's a two dimensional picture. So we have uh, one dimension vertically, one dimension horizontally, but also third dimension. And we marked that third dimension with, with colors. So that's what, what we already mentioned and start talking about that. So you see that most of the components map well to the collaborative manufacturing elements. You can see the colors, but there are two components that cover two, two CMEs. So those are these two components with, with two, two colors. <clears throat> okay, so, so that's, uh, that's one dimension. Uh, but let's let's go through to the other two dimensions that uh, I don't know map map first to the physical organization and the other to the logical organization in, in my view of the things. <clears throat> so if we go through through the vertical uh, what we call layers, I mean they're vertical like this, but actually layers are horizontal, these are layers, connected objects, uh, the first layer. That's what, what happens close, close to the edge uh, in the factories. 
so IoT devices. Uh, you can see some components there. Uh, above it is the smart factory. So that's that includes some uh, intermediate layer and um, uh, that, that connects the connected those objects at the edge, some servers and so on. Uh, that's the smart factory layer. And the third layer is what happens outside the factory. So digital supply network. So that, that looks like a, like a physical organi organization of, of things and maps well to, to those collaborative manufacturing schemes that, that, we, that we mentioned. Uh, and the, the third dimension is a logical, uh, uh, logical organization. So that's what we call levels. So these are levels. Uh, you can see three levels here. And you can see that uh, components map well to these levels. So there's uh, every component maps to exactly one level. Yes, in, in, in this horizontal division, we, we had only this one very general component that mapped to all three layers. But uh, and the others are within one layer, but in the, in the vertical, vertical division, Every component belongs to just one level. So those levels are first levels, hardware enabled and device level security. So what happens at the device level, uh, the second layer is inter-device, what happens between devices. So inter-device level security based on distributed ledger technologies so that one of the technologies that we use is blockchain here, distributed ledger. And the third one is machine learning based cognitive security level. So that's something even even higher in, in a logical, logical view of things. And this component, it should be 13 components or so, or maybe, yeah, 13, these 13 components are what we call runtime run components. Uh, you will see uh, a more detailed description when we get to uh, in the other session when, when we get to the MVP and so on. There are four more components. So these 13 components that are runtime components that we already described, you can see them here, but here uh, at the bottom of this figure, you can see four more components that are <clears throat> that have more like they're not runtime components but have supportive role. We call them secure development and configuration components. Uh, Honeypot, Desire, FSV, and Interaction, Interactive Visualization. <clears throat> okay, and, and those uh, we, didn't go, we didn't go into details uh, in this. With, didn't describe every component, didn't describe their interaction. You can see their in interaction here and also here. So this is the interaction between runtime components with, with those black arrows. And the, this is the interaction between the secure development and configuration components and runtime components. Uh, they're described in detail in uh, deliverable 1.3, that's system architecture and it's a public public deliverable if you want to know more details. Uh, and right now, uh, as, as I mentioned, we are we've just finished the first year of the project. We're in month 13. And uh, at the end of the month 12, so the, the first first half, the first half of the project, as you can see here, was all about uh, positioning, defining the use cases, requirements, um, then uh, defining architecture. And uh, sec in the second part, so Q3 and Q4, uh, we focus focused on the MVP, minimum viable product. So that's what we delivered at the end of uh, month 12. You've seen uh, nine scenarios 
within three use cases uh, described in, in that slide where we describe requirements. And for MVP, we selected four of those, four of those nine. Uh, and so you, you can see them here from Raytheon Technologies, we selected scenarios one and three, control and secure uh, remote maintenance and trusted sharing compliance data across the supply chain. One scenario from Philips, shop floor detection, threat detection and prevention. And one scenario from Renault, secure and connected objects. <laughs> and uh, in, in the MVP version that, that covers of the system that covers those scenarios, uh, only, only some of the components that you can see here uh, uh, as a list uh, are running, are up and running and, and have been uh, integrated. Uh, you will see a description of, of how, how the, this initial version of the system works. And you will also see uh, some demonstration of components that, that are up and running, that are working, but not still not yet integrated into the, the system. And there are some components that we will develop in the, in the future. <clears throat> so that, that's, the, that's what, where we are now with, with, the, with the MVP. And okay, I, I think, yes, I think this, this concludes some short overview of the Collapse project. And this concludes my presentation. Uh, I don't know if we have some time left for maybe a quick question or two. I can then stop sharing my screen. Yeah, I think we have. Thanks, Sergeant. Mm -hmm. um, any question people uh, willing to ask? Okay, in general, uh, I wanted to say that uh, we have um, the, the chat as well as the Q&A uh, feature. So just feel free to pose any question. Uh, we will uh, collect them and handle them um, in the course of the workshop in the Q&A uh, session. Uh, uh, slots. So, okay. So I would say that maybe we can uh, continue with the next uh, uh, presentation in the um, in the in the agenda. This is about uh, this is uh, about an industrial vision uh, for. Uh, Industry 4.0 uh, in Europe. I'll, I'm very happy to introduce Professor Sol, who is invited in this uh, workshop and will give us um, an overview about all this. Thanks a lot. Okay, shall I take over the screen? Yes, please. Share. Now late from the start. Okay, thank you for uh, this opportunity to share my views on uh, what we should need, to, what we need to do in, uh, in the manufacturing environment and in particular on the shop floor. My presentation is uh, really based on the work we are doing in the Netherlands in, in our Dutch initiative for the 4.0, uh, uh, Industry 4.0, which we call Smart Industry in which we have about 45 different field labs in which we do all kinds of experiments. And at a certain moment, also the cybersecurity issue came up and therefore we created the workshop. But before I come to the workshop in the end, I'll uh, have explained a lot. By the way, I have a lot of slides. I'll share them with the, the organizers. So whenever you want to have the slides or the PDF of the slides, you can have them. It's our ambition to come to the, the most uh, flexible or best digital connected production network, not only within the factory, but also between factories and the whole value chain. And for that, you need to connect a lot of equipment uh, to the internet. And it is quite easy to plug in an, uh, an ethernet cable in a production line. 
uh, and just start monitoring uh, your production flow, um, monitoring the status of your equipment for all kinds of things. Uh, it's pretty easy, but how about cybersecurity? Uh, a lot of people think about these hackers uh, these days, but it is really a war ongoing. And what happened in the Netherlands, at least uh, after the Stuxnet uh, sabotage of uh, Iran, Iranian hackers probably started to attack a Dutch uh, company called Digenota with uh, submitted certificates. There was a, a, a journalist who started to investigate in it. And after 10 years, he published recently a book, which was called in, in, in English, actually it's written in Dutch, it is war, but it, no one notices it. And actually the whole message in this book is that it's far more serious than people realize. The next war won't be fight with guns and, and tanks, but much more with these uh, cybersecurity things. There are a lot of uh, military trained people who after some time leave the services and are allowed in countries like Iran, North Korea, but also in China and in Russia, who then start a, a, a commercial activity on hacking others. And those are extremely professional, professional people. And they are allowed by their national uh, uh, national security agencies to continue with it. So out there, there is a far more ongoing than people realize. And the, the example I quite often explain to people is: Have you ever seen what happens if you go on the internet? It's not going that you that you connect with one page, but quite easily you connect with ten different pages, and you hardly know uh, these days anymore what is ongoing. And this is only from the last five to ten years that happening. But nevertheless, that means that in the production environment, we really have to do a lot. And in previous slide, actually, if I go back, you can see this castle in, in, in Wales, in England, which was probably the best kept uh, or secret uh, or, or defensible castle possible with three different layers in it. The only problem was it was so costly that it never finished uh, the building of it. And that also is a little bit the case with a lot of cybersecurity things. You can do each very advanced things, but it is, it's, it's almost so costly that it won't work in the end. So the question is a little bit, what, what can we do in the most simple way to protect production equipment? And not only because it is not an office environment where, where if you hack a PC, it's, it's to, to, to a certain extent, but if you start hacking robots or even power plants, these kinds of things, it's, uh, the consequences are, are, are even physical uh, damage to people. So you have to protect it uh, even further than office networks. In this particular case, I'll explain already my message in the whole presentation, is that you add an other firewall inside your company and put your production line in their own subnets, not one, probably multiple subnets with their own firewall. There's, uh, there's no USB, no Wi-Fi, uh, that might become a discussion later on. No Wi-Fi, no hidden uh, eSIMs with uh, 3G or 4G or 5G, just everything wired connected, connected such that you can see what is happening there and no one else gets access to it. So are we really going to lock down production networks? But a lot will happen then. In the presentation, after this vision, on um, uh, after this introduction, I'll share a vision which I say that this data collection is just the beginning of it. There will be far more and more things developing in which you become really a data-driven company. And not only the company, the whole value chain will happen with it. So I'll go a little bit more in data collection from machining, uh, machine data into um, the level of digital twinning, all the legal issues with it. And finally, also the, 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 the intercompany data platforms or data ecosystems like the industrial data space, for example. Then I'll focus on the standards like uh, OCP, OC, OPC UA, uh, why we are using it for it, and also make it more secure on it. And finally, I'll come to the, the training workshop and, uh, and the final conclusion. Collecting data is a trend which started, of course, with mainframes, then software became important, then uh, uh, communication, um, people could make a lot of money with it. Later on, what really happened was that platforms are now important. It's much more the internet of people, connecting people with wired systems, but also the mobile systems. But the latest trend is really that it is not so much anymore about internet of people, but internet of things combined with internet of services. And that involves a lot of data collection. So if you would look in the industrial environment, what you did saw was that it was it started all uh, industrial control with camshells and things like that, hardware. 
then the proprietary PLCs, um, in which quite often you had a switch and a motor, a one-to-one -one coupling between inputs and outputs. Then we got into more advanced PLCs, the proprietary field buses like Profibus and all these kinds of uh, d differentiation of it. But what we'll see finally is that it becomes more TCP IP Ethernet based. But below it is important trend ongoing. And that is that in internet uh, or in industrial internet environments, you see that the average between input outputs is growing. There are far more data collected. And even there are already cases of a hundreds to one in, in design kind of environments. So you collect a lot of data. You don't do that anymore with uh, traditional PLCs. In the picture, you see a PLC from Kun, Kunbus. It's uh, actually a kind of edge computer, but you can use it as a PLC because it has its 24 voltage uh, with it. But the nice thing about it is you program the, the, the PLC logic in, in Python. So on the IO level, this asynchronous IO, you can do it. But then on the user interface, you can do it on the data collection and even on the analytics to the level, but you won't do that on these devices to artificial intelligence. Uh, and in this picture, I show a little bit the, why you are collecting all the data ultimately for AI, but AI is really an iceberg with a lot of work below it. And that's where we are talking about. So what's happening? Not only that we collect this data, uh, now for zero paper uh, environment, uh, zero defect, uh, controlling after production step, uh, zero programming of robots, why use, uh, why program a robot when you do have already the cut files into what you could call a digital factory, in which you can produce known series of products. It will evolve to more smart factories where you can have far more different variants of products, uh, smaller series, 3D printing, lot sizes one, change over within cycle time of equipment, all these kinds of developments. And ultimately in, in, in let's say 10, 15 years, you'll see that you also get a sustainable factory in which you do also disassembling of these products, which you hardly know actually. But nevertheless, uh, it's at this moment, this digital factory. And in the digital factory, what we do see at this moment of course, you have the ERP systems, uh, those kinds of things, or uh, MRPs, manufacturing resource planning, but you want to have real-time data from your factory floor. Not that at the end of the day, they fill in forms and things like that, but really that the machines start communicating directly to the MRP systems and you can do the real-time scheduling. So initially we have a few systems, uh, digitalized work cells, but what is happening now is that more and more of the machines are interconnected and you start collecting this data. Now, you won't store it in the long run in these ERP systems. You, you'll create much more digital twins, not digital twins of your products, uh, digital twins of your uh, machinery, but also digital twins of your whole production systems. And you start updating it. So there's a lot of developments ongoing. And on that level, you have all the RCT uh, cybersecurity support. But in the manufacturing line itself, and that's the focus in the bottom of the slide, there is this uh, additional need for more protection on it. Why then, before I go into focusing on the, on the, the edge and the OIT, uh, the, the operational technology environment, why, why are we collecting all this data? Well, realize that the ERP system these days are extended with an outside interface. They called it customer portals, such that customers can see the progress of the value of production as well. And especially in, in value chains, you want to look deep into the value chain on the status of the different components so that you can reschedule if necessary. And particularly with COVID, we saw that that is quite important. So it's, it's, it's not only the digital uh, digitalization within your factory, but you have to collect that data to become part of a value chain in which all the partners uh, allow this access to their uh, progress. So combined, we'll, we'll have these kind uh, two combined. But the message here is really, you are just at the beginning of collecting all kinds of data in the factory floor and start using that particular data. I mentioned it already. You'll ultimately put it into what you could call a digital twin, uh, also a digital twin um, on, uh, on your uh, production side. This particular case is for products in which you don't have a digital twin for the design alone, but for every individual product you produce, you'll have a digital twin in which you store the historical data of the manufacturing. And later on for sustainability, you'll also store all the data during the use time of the product that once you get it back, you can you know exactly how to disassemble it uh, and the status of it and which components are usable still. Nevertheless, how do you fill those digital twins? 
Well, in that case, I'll focus in particular on, on what is now common uh, or gaining uh, the majority as, as, an, uh, as an industrial uh, standard for the equipment communication, and that's the OPC UA. And why is that? Well, the OPC UA has an object tree, a namespace like an object tree in which you can easily map it onto a digital twin. In this particular case, I show you a few OPC services, which uh, are sensors in a prediction line. And then at a level higher, this is the case of a warehouse, you'll, you'll get different status. The temperature of the whole warehouse, of, of the air quality of it, or whether doors are open, that kind of stuff. So you see here already a hierarchy of all kinds of information which you can fill with these OPC UK messages, which are actually based upon XML. The, the other world for a digital twin, you could call it the administrative shell, the, the, the Verwaltungsschale in Germany, which is now being standardized in industry 4.0. Um, but it's all uh, directly linked to this OPC UA. And why is this OPC UA so uh, attractive? It's not only at the lower level of the TCP IP and, and the ethernet, but it is really that, it, that, 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 it is, that, that you can become interoperable with these standards, uh, the different classes for different equipment in the OPC UA standard. In this particular case, you see um, the evolution. Uh, oh, actually, I can skip this one. This is even, even in Python programming with the um, um, A-Sync uh, IO, it, it really is, uh, is, is quite simple to do. But next to all these digital things and open standards and these kinds of things, realize there is another issue, and that's a legal issue. Sensor data is not copyright protected. Um, copyright we know, but then there is la human labor involved in it. But in sensor data, that's not the case. So the moment you start sharing this kind of machine data with others, you don't have any control about it. Uh, well, the only way you can do it is set up legal contracts, but how to enforce them uh, quite often for smaller companies in the value chain, it's, it's extremely costly to have those lawyers check those uh, contracts which the big companies probably put all the time. So in smart industry, we made already a template of it, but the, there are a lot of digital, uh, legal things with it. So one conclusion I have in this particular case is that don't give others direct access to your equipment, like service providers for equipment, but also these uh, other uh, uh, customers of you. Not only because of the cyber risk, if you get, give, allow them to access your equipment, the hacker can do it as well, but also for the legal reasons that you have, that it is pretty difficult to get con uh, keep control over it. So collect your data actually really inside your factory yourself from your OT subnets, Make sure that it is stored in your own databases, which could be in the cloud anyway, and then start sharing with these inter-cloud traffic uh, platforms, these uh, manufacturing data platforms, uh, or a coupling of different cloud environments. It, it started with the industrial data space, later it was rephrased to international data spaces, and we see it now being used as a basis for the Gaia X uh, developments within Europe. And why, is these, uh, why, are, why are these platforms so important? Well, if you start having data, some of it you could share with it, but the other part you don't share with it. But the part you share, if you share it, for example, with Uber about the uh, uh, cars available, that kind of things, or uh, Airbnb with hotel rooms available, they actually get all the data and they don't share it with you. So if you want to have a commons model and, and where everybody gets an equal share, you have to come up with these new platforms which are now being developed in, in development like Gaia X. And why are they so important? Well, in this particular case, I show you that a value chain, of course, a product consists out of different uh, material, bill, bill of material, uh, which is already an explosion. And sometimes you have different suppliers to it. And then if a company inside that value chain is part of different value chains, you can imagine that, that it is an explosion of uh, others you have to communicate with uh, from your customer platform, or if you want to reschedule a value chain, it's pretty complicated. These are the figures from McKinsey. For example, for tech companies, it's about 100 plus first tiers. And in automotive, it's even more. And behind those first tiers, there are thousands of other companies. So in the end, if you want to go uh, scheduling and get sharing information beyond your own factory, you need to have these manufacturing platforms uh, where all the IT security is available for. 
So in this particular case, if you would have for the upper level here for your uh, flow initially, but later on, if you get products back and you monitor the status of the products while they are in use, all the kind of stuff, and you store it in your digital twin, great, these platforms. But inside your factory, you want to keep it secret. You want to make sure that all the data there is first stored in a controlled environment and then shared with others. And that will happen later on in this environment, these environments as well. So let's focus a little bit more on this uh, OT environment, this operational technology environment, um, and especially on the, on the cybersecurity part. So at the engineering level or the office or the company level, you have these uh, data platforms for uh, exchanging everything to everything. So there is no need to have others having direct access to your equipment. So you start isolating it in your own OT subnet. No Wi-Fi, no USB, locked firewalls, all these kinds of things I'll explain in the next slides. But the problem a little bit is with OT people don't understand IT environments. And IT people are, are, are making things too complicated for the OT environment. So the question is a little bit, how are you going to do it? Uh, because no one told these OT people, these operational people, because they want to produce and they don't want to play with IT systems, how to do it. And then there is this lack of digital skills. So we decided to set up a workshop. In this particular workshop, it's, uh, it's a, a, a Raspberry Pi based uh, edge computer, this Kunbus uh, device, it's a 24 volt, it's uh, 500 euro. But for the workshop, we just grabbed uh, a couple of uh, Pi's, put some IO on it and, and, and created a workshop. And in this workshop, we first learned people, it's a one day workshop to collect data, the, the simple data, you see an example here. And, and this is a more extensive visit. So just playing around with these edge computers, uh, working with Linux uh, a little bit, uh, and, and then doing a little programming or pre-programmed uh, programs with some errors in it, and they have to correct them. Then what happens, uh, this is by the way, this uh, Kunbus, uh, but what happens once they start collecting this data, at a certain moment, we hack them. We continuously hack them again and again and again. And with all the relays in it, once a group is, or a participant is being hacked, every other, uh, everyone else in the room hears that, that one of the devices has been hacked again. So what are we doing then? Well, first of all, we, we, they, they haven't changed, of course, passwords. So that's pretty easy to hack a PC over the network uh, or a Pi on, uh, easily. Then they don't realize that there are hidden users and they have to block the hidden users. Then there is certain software pre-installed in it. And so by the end, they really get frustrated. And then they come to the level that they start realizing they have to put it behind the firewall. But what to do is a firewall, uh, pretty costly things. Although these firewalls we use are just 50 euros. So that's not, uh, not so much the issue. But firewalls are quite often complex especially if IT people start playing with firewalls, uh, even I sometimes lose what they are doing with it. Um, but in this particular case, we want to have a simple firewall, a firewall which blocks actually everything except the OPC OA standard. You see already here the line in the firewall, the firewall rule for it. Uh, I'll show it on the next slide a little bit more, but it just says uh, the, the protocol. This, this is a simple thing uh, to learn uh, people. This is the more extended one. In this particular firewall, what you see here is really that we only allow inside the subnet only local traffic and no Wi-Fi, so you really know what's happening. We make sure that input uh, from the router uh, to program the router is only from inside, so the IT people cannot uh, control that particular router, which is quite soft and a row between them, but nevertheless, once they understand that they, uh, they can work with it. You block not a network address table, and that means that from a web server, from a web interface inside the network, uh, like for example at home, with the NAT you can go outside. That's being blocked here. So no one of the devices can go just uh, simply outside. Uh, so one of the machines with an embedded uh, web browser in it cannot go to their vendor and, 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 and they start exchanging all kinds of production data from, uh, from the machine to that particular vendor. You just block it. The only thing you allow is OPC UA traffic you initiate. So that's a destination that uh, yours, and the rest is being blocked. In firewall terminology, it's just about seven lines on it. And if I go to the next slide, it's just, this is standard firewall roles, that's no issue. And then there is this one of uh, blocking the, the, 
the not the network address uh, so nothing is going out of it and this is the only line you have to in program is so in the workshop really we we learn people how to play with this firewall how to change it ultimately to the level that they have for configured their own uh, setting for their production line and then they can't be hacked anymore the whole thing because of uh, COVID, we were not allowed to continue with the workshops. So in the end, we decided to put everything on uh, on YouTube. You can find it on YouTube, Smart Industry Talks. I have to say, this is an English uh, Congress. Uh, the the slides, or uh, the the tech talks. These are all in Dutch actually, because of the target group. We wanted to have normal production line people understand it, uh, experience. Uh, get frustrated by being hacked in this uh, workshop environment such that later on in their own production environment, they are far more aware about the risks. So we did it in Dutch, uh, the slides are in English and maybe we'll make an English version of it. Uh, on the data sharing, it's already in English by the way, so you can use it on that. So explain a little bit why all this data collection is not only necessary already today, but it will become more and more and more important in the nearby future, not only inside your factory, but also in the value chain upstream, uh, but also downstream. That all the data need to be shared in IT environments, uh, even in the cloud type of environments, uh, but in the, in the production line itself and the machining environment itself, you have to put uh, a lot of additional protection on it and not by making it more complicated, but by making it as simple as possible and, and to keep it as isolated uh, as possible with this uh, working shop. So the final slides I hope you can uh, remember in the nearby future is actually this trend. These and digital revolutions uh, are happening faster and faster and faster. Where in the old days, your children were having the same crafts as, 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 as you did, you see already these days that, that with your school knowledge, you don't reach your retirement anymore. And with even in, uh, inside your own career, you'll have to change uh, to subjects and, and, and acquire a lot of new knowledge. So long, long, uh, lifelong learning is becoming a myth, and especially in these, uh, this, this regarding these digital skills, because well, never ever in mankind, we had this need to have this uh, lifelong learning and realize that if you are now already 35 years and older, 20 years, or 20 years ago in the year 2000, you were 15 or older, and you didn't have internet at school. So you never got any digital training. Of course, when you went to university, you probably got more, but a lot of these people in the environment, their production environments, they just don't have got, uh, gotten the digital training. And we now have this internet of things which resulted in this smart industry or this, this fourth industrial revolution in connecting everything to everything. But the next 10 years we'll see this artificial intelligence, quantum computing, and, and we just can't, uh, we can't predict what the industrial consequences is, will be. But the only thing we can predict is that lifelong learning is going to be a must. And for that reason, we designed this, uh, this particular workshop. The question is a little bit, what else can we do to train all these kinds of people? So with this, uh, I'll end my presentation. Um, it's really funded a little bit by the Minister of Economic Affairs and these kinds of things. Uh, and my background is on this one as well. And with that, I'll, uh, I'll stop uh, sharing. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Sol. Uh, very, very interesting, uh, in, let's say, presentation and really, really very well tied to uh, Collapse Project. Uh, um, I have just a couple of quick questions. You, you touch upon uh, several very important uh, topics, devices, connectivity, uh, security, uh, data needs of collecting data, um, sharing this data and analyzing this data to make the production more efficient, uh, understand where are gaps. Uh, I think, uh, and, and also you, you touched upon the complexity of managing complex uh, infrastructures with uh, layers and uh, authorization of data flows through them. I think these are really, really um, topics that we're also uh, looking at in Collapse. Um, <coughs> besides, let's say, uh, uh, also collaborative uh, scenarios, so cross uh, company uh, collaboration and connectivity. So this is one area where I wanted to ask your input. So um, 
so we are seeing uh, a lot of need uh, of uh, integration uh, uh, in the supply chain between different manufacturer. So for example, the international situation shows us how market can be really unpredictable because uh, global uh, events can uh, disrupt uh, strongly any well done prediction. Um, and so the need of um, uh, supply chain to cope with uh, ah. these uh, unpredicted events and cope with very quick change, which means uh, that of course, uh, digitalization and uh, better integration between partners in the supply chain is going to be an enabler for this kind of uh, agility yeah, that's, in the market. That's at this moment the trend that all these ERP systems, they want to put uh, information in the customer portal so that their vendors or their customers can see the progress of the production. But that means that, that you also uh, uh, have to connect your equipment uh, to it to, to provide real-time updates of how far it is. I mean, every customer knows when he orders a package, you can trace that exactly where the package is at any moment. But that's what, what industrial customers want to have is their orders as well. But then the, my message is continuously realize that on the production floor itself, keep it as simple as possible. Don't introduce their uh, uh, extra features uh, and, and especially hidden uh, uh, 5G type of ships, uh, which you don't know what is happening in it, uh, Wi-Fi's uh, on it. Uh, it. It all makes it more complicated and, and people who are responsible for the production line and also the human safety on it, they don't know what's happening anymore. How can they take the responsibility for it unless you keep it as simple as possible? Yes, exactly. And this goes towards the, the direction of the second point I wanted to ask you, which is uh, what is the right strategy to make these digital technologies and the related cybersecurity uh, features uh, more easily um, acceptable? Because uh, you know that manufacturing plants are very expensive um, technology, uh, let's say, yeah. uh, assets. So uh, we do need to cope also with legacy. So what, what is there and, 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 and how to make um, mm -hmm. also running production accept changes uh, that are upcoming? Legacy and these kinds of things, uh, it's pretty simple. These new trends of open systems make it so cheap that you can just uh, put a shell around it, uh, just put a Raspberry Pi on it with uh, Linux and these kinds of things. But then I immediately hit on the problem. Big companies have enough uh, people with uh, skills for it, but the majority of the companies are small companies like 50 people or 200 people, and they don't have these uh, experts uh, on IT. So for smart industry, but industry 4.0, the message is a little bit 1% of the companies are doing it already, no problems. Uh, but the other 99% of it are medium-sized companies, small companies. And they are in huge numbers. So the challenge is now coming from 1% of companies applying uh, Industry 4.0 to at least 10% of the companies. And that's that's the technology is there. It's much more an educational challenge. So this whole Industry 4.0 and by now is really a challenge in educating existing employees uh, with these kinds of digital skills. And that's a huge, huge challenge. It's not a technology challenge, uh, despite all the funding available for new kinds of technologies. The real challenge is getting all these people who never got the opportunity to understand these new technologies and which for the rest of their career needs to have much more background on uh, digital technologies, train them in the digital skills. That's why I call this uh, never ever in a mankind before type of challenge we have. Uh, we, we know initial education is organized quite well with schools and things like that already centuries. But now we are facing a situation that we have to train people continuously. Thank you very much. Um, any, any additional question? So everyone keep in mind that we have also a Q&A session. So later on, so we'll have, uh, so if you want to think over your questions and um, and get it and, and keep it for the uh, for the, the the slot after the next speaker. Yeah. Okay. So if uh, if I can, uh, I'd be happy to introduce Erwin from Philips. Give us um, 
end user perspective on the cybersecurity challenges that we are facing. Thanks. Yes, good morning, everyone. Let me share my screen. And you should be able to see my screen right now. Able to hear me fine. I see Valeria nodding. So let me get started. Good morning, everyone. I just want to give a big thank you to Professor Saul for his uh, engaging talk. As a consortium, we are very uh, grateful that the professor was willing and able to, uh, to join us here today. Uh, as luck has it, I was able to actually uh, attend one of these workshops that the professor mentioned. And uh, yeah, I can, uh, I can say that it's uh, indeed well made and very interesting. So, uh, my name is Erwin Moet. I am here today to represent Philips, uh, specifically Philips Drachten, as uh, my section is regarding the end users of the Collapse project, so uh, otherwise known as the demonstrators. I work for Philips as an IT architect in our largest production site in Western Europe, where I'm focused on manufacturing IT. <clears throat> I'm joined here today by Valerio Semi, who is uh, doing all the introductions, and also by Erwan Ledise, who is representing Renault as a cybersecurity specialist. As Valerio mentioned, Valerio works as a discipline leader cybersecurity within the Advanced Laboratory on Embedded Systems, which is now part of Raytheon. So our three companies are the end users in the project. This means that we are the ones conducting experimentation and validation of all of the technologies that are being developed as part of the Collapse framework. So uh, I'm representing Philips Drachten. We are located in the northern part of the Netherlands, as you can see on the map right there. Uh, with regards to production, what we do is we produce shavers, shaver heads, and also the Philips Avent line, which uh, uh, relates to mother and child care. So for the context of the project, we are the mass consumer goods manufacturer. At our site, we have approximately 2,100 employees from about 40 different nationalities, spread over a production site of about 200,000 square meters. Our site started in 1950, and still today, our site is very important for the future of personal health within Philips. We're driving key innovations, using highly advanced automated production methods to keep costs low. We want to remain competitive while still being able to produce in Europe, which is something that I think we can be very proud of. Our development departments in Drachten also guide and steer uh, operation at production and supply centers across the world. So we try to use a unique combination of innovation new product introduction and operations to help empower our site. So for us as a site, it's very important that we remain a top performer in manufacturing. Uh, we believe that tomorrow's performance targets can only be met if we continually improve and we recognize that security plays a very important aspect in all of that. So on behalf of uh, Valerio, let me explain his position and Raytheon as a company. So Raytheon is an international organization working in the aerospace and defense sector. Raytheon participates in Collapse through ALES. ALES is the Italian site of, of its research center. So ALES brings R&D expertise in embedded systems and communication cybersecurity. ALES within the project leads work package six, which means that ALES is responsible for the industrial demonstrators and, bring, and it brings a use case to us from Pratt & Whitney. So Pratt & Whitney is a world leader in jet engine manufacturing, which has a large industrial footprint in Europe. Digitalization of manufacturing processes is considered to be essential in the aerospace sector. So in this context, the protection of sensitive data, the continued operations of plants is considered to be essential for parts and quality assurance. So on behalf of uh, Renault, let me explain on behalf of uh, Erwan Ledisse, his position and the Renault group. So Erwan is part of the security department, which falls under the responsibility of the CISO group within Renault. Uh, this includes 
Uh, their mission is to ensure cybersecurity for Renault as a whole, including engineering, supply chain, manufacturing, and all of the support functions. So Renault Group has operated uh, major transformations in response to changing challenges in the automotive sector and, cha and changes in expectations coming from customers. Several new initiatives are driven by the Industry 4.0 revolution at each step of the supply chain and manufacturing process. So these innovations involve new, new uses like interconnection of billions of devices, embedded in industrial systems, integrations of new kinds of IoT systems, new kinds of digital workstations, interconnection of traditionally segregated systems and networks. So the convergence of OT IT, which the professor touched upon as well connected plans to support digital and cloud services and many other innovations. So on another, you know, the, the other side of the equation is that these innovations lead to an exponential increase in security risks and attack surface, which are very critical for production, uh, for productivity, having a major financial impact if things do go wrong. So Renault Group is one of the industries that has been affected by the WannaCry malware, uh, fortunately with a limited impact. But this was a catalyst, which why a few years ago, Renault started a global cybersecurity program to upgrade its manufacturing process to be on the right level of security using state-of-the-art cybersecurity solutions. Now, in order to go further and anticipate future cybersecurity challenges, Renault wants to define a disruptive strategy to support digital transformation and digital collaboration between manufacturing and value chains. They want to identify new architectures and technologies to protect industrial environments against new threats as they relate to Industry 4.0. Renault's participation to the Collapse Project will help to feed and define the strategy. So as an end user, Renault participates to the definition of the security challenges and has defined different relevant use cases for this project. So as briefly mentioned before in the, uh, in the keynotes, uh, Renault has as its scenarios, the controlled and secured remote maintenance, cloud-based architecture for industrial process, asset management, conformity assessment and threat detection, and security of connected devices. So in order to validate and evaluate the solutions developed by Collapse, Renault will create an Industry 4.0 experimentation lab, which uh, aims to reproduce or simulate a real manufacturing plant. So this lab will take part in the global and long-term strategy of Renault, uh, of Renault Cybersecurity Group, and will help to create collaborations between academics and industrials. So bringing it to the real world, essentially. So uh, let's talk a little bit about threats that we see in manufacturing divided in a number of categories. Now, this is by no means a complete list. So starting off with IT versus OT, which also relates to what the professor was saying earlier, uh, IT versus OT, convergence or lack thereof. Uh, still to this day, there is a very big confusion, but sometimes frustration when I'm talking about IT versus OT and OT versus IT. And from the perspective of the IT professional, OT is a threat. And the same thing is true from the perspective of the OT professional, IT is a threat. So we, we simply can't seem to understand each other. We speak a different language and yeah, uh, education is definitely a very important thing uh, when it comes to understanding each other. So um, to give one example of this within IT, it's, it's very, uh, within IT, it's very common to have uh, by default a system where we actively scan all of our assets and you know, we, we try to find gaps in security, leaks, misconfigurations, all these kinds of things, uh, where when we do this on the OT side, this is actually a huge constraint. So this is not something that we want to do from an OT perspective, simply because a lot of these systems in the OT worlds are very sensitive to active scanning. So we're, we're dealing with systems that can be very fragile. Um, things like an active scan on OT equipments can have you know, fairly disastrous consequences where it can actually have an impact in, in safety as well. So we have a discussion of safety versus security as well to consider. 
where as IT professionals, we're all about uh, security, keeping things secure. And from an OT perspective, there's actually safety to consider. So actually bodily harm to personnel, um, things that can go wrong in that area. So imagine what happens when an IT process impacts OT equipment in a way where a massive press suddenly starts moving where the operator is not in control. You know, this can have serious uh, safety consequences, safety risks. Or imagine like a, a robot arm which does not understand its balance properly anymore. This can have safety risks. So there is also, as always, the discussion uh, of uptime versus updates. It it's, it's continues to be, and this is true for every manufacturer, it continues to be very troublesome to, to talk about this. So what's actually more important, having a, uh, having a good uptime or having a good, uh, having a, uh, or having our, our systems be up to date, you know, because updating our systems means that the uptime goes down. So this is this is a constant field of, of tension between IT and OT people. It's it's very tricky to to help understand each other uh, when it comes to this area. Um, and there, and then of course there's the factor to consider that uh, oftentimes it's simply not possible to to update this equipment because the updates don't exist or the system cannot go down for any reason. Uh, we we have a lot of legacy equipment to deal with. You know, these are some of the realities of, of manufacturing. So finally, when it comes to IT versus OT, um, yeah, who actually owns what? So because this is also different for each company, uh, it, it makes for a very complex puzzle. So who owns which piece of the complex puzzle? So because this is so complicated, it, it can also lead to situations where, in fact, there's no one who owns a specific piece or an interconnection which can lead to other security gaps. So it's a complex puzzle. Um, speaking about interconnected environments. So I gave the example about automated scans and its impact a bit earlier. Um, as we move more and more towards an interconnected world with collaborative manufacturing, these lines, they, they begin to blur, you know, um, as, as the professor mentioned as well, where it's was always the norm, perhaps still is, to be isolated and disconnected between manufacturing and between office networks. Um, we're seeing a real tension there. You know, there, there are changes that are occurring. We, I think all of us, it's fair to say that all of us see a very strong desire for data, more and more data. You know, all differentiated into different levels of abstractions as well. So a process engineer might, might want raw data where a where a line uh, manager is interested in, in, in equipment efficiency. So these are all things to consider. Um, we want to support all of these developments, but still it's very important to, uh, to do this in a manner that's actually secure and actually that uh, enables uh, the secure uh, transport of this data. Um, let me speed up a little bit. So other threats that we see uh, coworkers and vendors, it's, it's very important to differentiate between uh, intentional and unintentional threats when it comes to people. So there's a large difference between a, a vendor that comes into our environment with a malware infected laptop or someone that is actively attempting to sabotage an environment. You know, these, these are things to consider. They have a, they have a very different uh, intense, but the impact can actually be similar and be fairly catastrophic, catastrophic in the same way. So uh, legacy, I mentioned legacy. We have a lot of legacy equipment to deal with, uh, unsupported operating systems, hardware, software. You know, sometimes we joke around where we say that we have certain operating systems in place right now that run production that are older than the people servicing them today. These are the realities of, of a manufacturing environment. So this is something that we need to take into account. Fragility, as I, I mentioned earlier, um, one thing to keep into mind is that OT equipment is fairly fragile. It's, it's uh, exceedingly easy to break these kinds of systems simply because they're not programmed to accept any inputs other than what the original programmer had defined for them. So things like a port scan can break them. They can be non, 
conforming to existing protocols and structures. So it, it, it makes for a very complex puzzle where we have to be very careful when we actually access OT equipment not to accidentally break them. So that's the level of fragility that we need to take into account. So existing countermeasures that we take as organizations, it's, it's of course a mixture between technical and organizational measures where we have IT security policies in place to hopefully uh, let people follow procedures, follow standards, not do anything too crazy. We want to have secure remote access in place for our vendors. So things like multi-factor authentication, uh, segmenting these, these flows is extremely important as mentioned earlier on by the professor. Network segmentation, uh, we can use specialized UTM which has support for industrial protocols. So we can actually understand the protocols that we're, that we're speaking on these environments and, and take certain measures to, to get in control better. Um, finally, I would say that the focus on knowledge and relationships is very important as well. So we need to understand that we will not ever uh, know everything that we need to know in order to do our jobs. And that's why, because we're all facing the same problems, we need to work together, share this knowledge and uh, continue to build our relationships. So to finalize uh, the end user section, I'd like to speak a little bit about the value add that the Collapse project is going to bring. So what we envision from Collapse is a complete novel security framework solution to help us protect the whole supply chain. Uh, we want to enable us to perform secure data exchanges across the digital supply chain, all while providing a high degree of resilience, reliability, accountability, and trustworthiness. We want the framework to address threat prevention, detection, mitigation, and, and ideally a real-time response. Um, we see that Collapse will achieve these goals by utilizing state-of-the-art technologies, making significant scientific and technological advances in various fields such as secure multi-part computation, homomorphic encryption, distributed deep learning, anomaly detection, distributed ledger technologies, smart contracts, and distributed remote software attestation. So I think it's fair to say that we have a, a fair number of very ambitious goals within our projects. And as demonstrators, I'd say that we are very excited to see real world solutions uh, for our real world problems. So thank you for listening. And I would like to end the presentation from the end user perspective from here. And we can start opening up the floor for the open discussion and Q&A. Thanks a lot, Erwin. So yeah, uh, that's perfect timing as well. So it would be, would be nice to have um, any question from from the attendees, so feel free to jump in. We have a little time here dedicated to this purpose. So maybe I can jump in with a quick question. I hope you can hear me. Um, Basically, I would have a question to both of you, Erin and Professor So, um, When comparing your presentations, Erin, you gave a look in the, uh, in the future where you said, okay, remote access is needed for the collaborative use cases. And um, Professor So, you, on the other hand side, had uh, a few presentations or slides in your slide deck. They said, okay, don't grant anyone else access to your local site. Um, can you briefly tell me if this, uh, how this fits together and is this because this is the current state and everything what you're talking about is so to say horizon two or three years so there things need to happen in order to get there. Um, so just to get the, the picture right about uh, those two, two aspects which are for sure uh, valid but maybe just it's a timing, timing aspect. Yeah, uh, I, I can respond and then Aaron can <laughs> add to it. If you have an outside vendor also having access to your equipment, uh, you can put it in the contract what he is allowed to do and what, what not, and not allowed to do. 
but can he guarantee that there is no hacker using the same connection to your equipment? And if there's a human safety involved in it, uh, the risks are too large. Um, so if the ven is the vendor really uh, willing to take um, the, the, the legal consequences of a thing like that? Where is, if you come with a construct in which you collect the data first and put it on an, for example, the industrial data space uh, cloud environment such that the vendor can have access to it, then, then you can have a, an, an, a less risk of having uh, hackers into your system. And for example, I know of Shell Oil now these days are having from every production site in the world, they have these digital twins and all the equipment, and there is no vendor allowed to have direct access uh, over the internet to their equipment. I mean, in the oil and gas industry, you can imagine that the explosion risks are even higher. So they collect all the data, put it in the cloud and in their own cloud environment and only provide it to vendors from that environment for the simple reason that the contracts are much easier. And, and not only the e contract is easier, but also the, the guarantee that the contract is not violated is, uh, is much simpler on, on that particular case. So, um, my expectation is that it will become the trend that uh, that outside vendors can have access to the information from their equipment, but that you first collect the information out of their equipment and put it available on these uh, things. And that's why this OPC UA standard is so important as well as the industrial data space or Gaia X when that happens. But it'll, it'll take some time before people realize what is happening. And again, the big companies know and have the capabilities to, to start doing it. In the nearby future, smaller companies should be helped to do the same. Yeah, so from our perspective, uh, what we're doing is we're basically taking a hybrid approach to that. So definitely where it is possible to simply share the data, we absolutely do that. We use our own data platforms that we've built uh, where we've connected all of our machines, all of our devices and transformations on that data and we make that available to vendors. There are still use cases where that's uh, not feasible simply because the vendor itself needs to have direct access to certain components. So the way that we've approached it is uh, we have a, a number of different organizational, but I, from my perspective, more important technological constraints in place. So one of the things is that we use multi-factor authentication. So each of the vendors, each of the persons, you know, unique, it's on a person basis that has access, this level of access, uh, has access on a per person basis using multi-factor authentication. Everything that a vendor does in our environments through our secure uh, remote access environments gets recorded. So if, if for, every, for whatever reason it becomes possible in the future to identify what happened on that day in that production line between these timestamps, we can do that. We can look back, see exactly what happened. Um, and other, other uh, constraints that are in place with us is that um, it's not possible for a vendor to uh, directly access a computer without an operator which is, act which is active on the shop floor to allow that connection. So that's a very, that was a very important constraint for us as well to have remote access. So that's, that's vital. So these are essentially how we're, um, yeah, the ways that we're approaching remote access. Thanks, thanks a lot. Um, so maybe if you allow just one more quick question. Uh, Erwin, you were addressing additional security measures like um, fine-grained access control or multi-factor authentication and stuff like that. Um, so, so you approach it more from a network perspective to say, okay, you're safeguarding your uh, perimeter security by a concisely managed firewall, for instance. Um, for example, OPC UA traffic. Do you still see any potential um, yeah, security risks which need to be handled, so to say, on the application layer or on the protocol layer? So opening, um, the board 48, uh, 48 something like this for um, OPC or A is some kind of additional access channel. So every new on your slide deck has a mouse hole. So this could be some kind of mouse hole where you can still get in. Uh, do you see a further need for protecting it? Although you might 
still open it at a very limited range to do something on top of um, yeah network level security on the application mm -hmm. layer, so to say. Yeah, yeah, no, it's a good question. Um, from my perspective, the vent should always be done in depth. So kind of like an onion, we have lots of different layers of security. Um, what we do for remote access specifically is we, we simply allow access to those specific systems that a vendor might need to access. So uh, upon the uh, segmentation on the production line level, as the professor mentioned, we also do a segmentation on the production line specifically to those devices that need to be accessed remotely. Um, and then finally, with regards to OPC UA, it, it is possible to enable encryption, authentication, all these kinds of uh, systems, but it, it quickly becomes a, a scalable problem. So looking at our use case, looking at how we address OPC UA and how we utilize that within our data platform, um, we're using all kinds of different solutions uh, for, with regards to containerization, orchestration. You know, we have a lot of different microservices which we use to communicate with OPC UA servers running on uh, uh, industrial machines. So once, if we want to enable authentication, which you, which you could do using X509 with uh, OPC UA, it, it very quickly becomes a very scalable problem. So we need to have unique uh, certificates in place for all these different machines. And then there are a lot of uh, practical concerns when it comes to security and OPC UA is it, something that we found. So we, we might en end up uh, doing more with that in the future, but for right now, it's, it's a practical concern, I would say. Thanks, I've just seen outside of David, there is a Another question just following up on uh, OPC UA. So maybe David, if you want to jump in and raise the question to Irina, Professor Sol. Yeah, pretty simple. I know about uh, uh, Mosquito as well, or MQTT. Uh, it's, a, it's, it's a lower level than the OPC UA. The OPC UA has really this uh, XML, this object tree database behind it, all these kinds of things that allow for much more flexibility. Although it's a little bit more complicated and that's a nice thing. And that's the reason probably why this uh, Mosquito protocol is still used uh, because it is so rather simple and it has been implemented in a lot of devices. But in the long run, you have to uh, start investigating into OPC UA. What, what we do uh, in our environment is we use both. So it's uh, a bit of a hybrid solution, you could say. So what we have is containers that connect to OPC UA servers. So receive the data and then they bridge it. So they pass it along using, for example, MQTT, or they push it on Kafka or whatever we want to do with the data. So we use both. But consider OP, uh, MQTT a little bit as a uh, as, uh, uh, legacy. I know I am upsetting a lot of people I know, but um, if you really go back to, to the origin of it, um, it's, uh, it's rather simple. Um, and the, the same as the Modbus uh, protocols, these kinds of things. Uh, in the long run, you'll you you won't have one uh, one standard. And I've been involved already since the seven uh, eighty seven with these kind of field bus stuff um, uh, in PLC environments. Uh, and it is a really shitty environment that these vendors were able to sell those proprietary solutions because in the beginning of the nineties in the internet world they standardized on HTML. And all of a sudden, you didn't worry about it anymore, and you created all the web apps and later on the mobile apps. And in the industrial environment, we got stuck in these kind of stupid uh, field bus differentiations, and you can never leverage on it. Whereas in the internet, it became clear that this whole growth of uh, web apps and, uh, and mobile apps is it's 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 so much better, and that. I'm quite happy to see now that OPC UA, which is rather much based on HTML, is, is gaining access because in the end it's about making the applications and not getting stuck into uh, all kinds of situations. Thanks a lot. So um, uh, it was a very interesting conversation. Actually, I had also additional questions for related to the OPC UA initiative. Maybe we can keep it uh, uh, for the late, latter uh, open discussion. Uh, Professor, sorry if you're able to stay, that would be great. Um, for the moment, uh, now we plan to have a brief uh, stop for everyone to refresh. Um, 
I really want to thank uh, all the speakers so far. It was a very interesting uh, kickoff of the discussion. And uh, after the break, we will uh, go a little deeper in the technologies that we are developing in the projects. Great, really, thanks a lot again. Uh, I'll see everyone in um, at 10, 15, 55. Hello, everybody. Thanks uh, for this short break for everyone. It was helpful and welcome back. We are now going to uh, proceed with the rest of the uh, sessions. So the next speaker will be Ernesto from- Hello, Infina. good morning. Can you hear me? Yeah, very well. Hello. Uh, please go on. Mm. Okay, I hope you can see my screen. Well, I, hello, good morning. I'm Ernesto Gomez Marin from Infinium and I am the leader of the Work Package 4, that is in charge of the security in the connected objects. And I will present this part. Here, we will talk about the lower security level of the project. We will start with an introduction. And then we will continue explaining every objective of the Work Package, explaining the proposed solution. And we will finish with a conclusion. The objective of the 
of the word packer are to build the tools and technologies for providing a, a secure execution environment for the edge IoT devices, to ensure a proper provision, configuration, and management of the edge node assets, including industrial IoT devices like sensor and network elements, for example, file gateways. And by last, to ensure that machine learning methods that perform the detection of complex anomalous and um, malicious behavior and implement it in a distributed way. From these objectives, we can extract uh, three tags. Security and threat at the edge, remote attestation, and threat detection and mitigation. Now, I will explain our attempts and plans in every, in every of these tags. Starting with security and thrombosiness at the edge. Our vision is, as already explained, as I already explained, to build uh, tools and technologies for providing secure execution environment for the edge of IoT devices. For, uh, with secure execution environment, we mean secrecy, integrity, authentication, authorization. Uh, anti-replay and no repudiation. And how we will do it? Our plan is do it using the rapidly emerging um, hardware technologies. We will st uh, our first effort in this task was implementing a hardware security module in an IoT node. There are hardware security modules available for almost all the programmable devices, but we decided to start First, with uh, um, working with the system on uh, with system of chips, in particular Raspberry Pi, and not other kind of microcontrollers like STM32, SNC, or, or PSOC, just because the prototype development in system on chips is much faster. Then we, um, we decided to use a um, hardware security module that follows the specification Trusted Platform Module, TPM because they are a reliable and very widespread specification designed by the, by the Trusted Computer Group, TSG. With this, we got a re reliable key management and an, uh, in an IoT device which are with a fast de prototype development. The next step was in, um, integrating the IoT sensor in the consortium blockchain hyperledger fabric that is needed for higher level systems. But what is blockchain? Okay, we can resume blockchain in, in a few words, like um, trusted framework that we, uh, that we consider as a closed roof of strat to execute smart contracts. But on the other hand, this the smart contract execution is as reliable as it is inputs. That's why integrating a TPM in the blockchain node is essential. We are providing security and reliability to the blockchain from the edge, improving the security for both oracles, which allow data to the blockchain, and the users. To make this integration, we made use of the standard PKCS11. And the last uh, attempt in this task was realized uh, in the integration of the attribute-based encryption, EV, in, in a Raspberry Pi. AVI is a kind of cryptographic algorithms that is needed for higher security level systems that will be explained further on. To use these algorithms, we required an open AV, a library that have a collision with other library, open SSL, that is needed for the system on sheet for other purposes. Therefore, it was implemented in a Docker container to avoid conflicts. Then the Docker has to be modified because the Linux distribution for the Raspberry Pi is designed for a 32-bit architecture. And finally, we got to use the attribute-based encryption in the Raspberry Pi. The second task is remote attestation. The objective of this task is to verify the integrity and the worthiness of devices in distributed industrial IoT and to serve as mechanisms toward mitigation processes. 
to do this, we are going to use a measure boot, a reliable, a very common remote attestation process. Linux. Um, uh, uh, Linux has a tool to do this, whose name is Integrity Measurement Architecture. This tool, using a TPM, realizes a measure boot and send the result signed by the TPM to an external agent. Here, our attempts is um, only focus on the um, interface development between the MAI and the TPM. Also, in the development of an external agent that take the measurements, check, uh, check them, and verify the integrity of the sensor. And finally, send the result to the threat detection and mitigation mechanisms, which is part of our last task, the task 4.3, explained by my colleagues Dimitris Alexopoulos from ITML. Yes, hello from my side as well. So uh, regarding um, the threat, uh, uh, the threat, our, our main target is to develop mitigation and immune reaction mechanisms across different layers. Layers and why do we identify different layers in order to efficiently abstract our efforts in those uh, in those aforementioned layers, namely the edge, the field layer, the field gateway layer, and the cloud layer. So, uh, as you can see here, starting from the edge layer, uh, we deal with the connected devices in production in an industrial environment. This uh, this means that the next layer is more like a logical uh, network based and functional uh, grouping layer for all the connected devices in this uh, industrial environment and finally uh, the cloud layer is an overarching umbrella connecting different use cases and scenarios uh, previously mentioned between different environments now for the uh, threat detection and mitigation uh, uh more specifically uh we we um uh, install we integrate data uh, by installing an agent on the edge layer uh, as well as performing custom integrations uh using known protocols like mqtt uh, it was an interesting discussion uh, uh, we had uh, previously and on the field gateway, we can also collect data from uh, devices that do not uh, support the installation of an agent. Now, on obviously, uh, the cloud layer then uh, caters for a helicopter view that allows uh, for a combinatorial review of all the available data, uh, gives us uh, the possibility to combine knowledge and expertise uh, about known threats in, and as well uh, enable uh, to take action towards uh, a multitude of uh, possible mitigation actions. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Now, as finally, we can conclude saying that this work package is creating the interface to unite existing novel technologies with the aim of serving as a foundation for a security oriented development in higher security level systems. Thank you very much. Are there any questions? Thanks a lot. Uh, and as for an increase for the presentation of the first layer or level of security for cost, um, we have a few more minutes left before we proceed with the second layer. Are there any questions right now? Um, I've just seen there has been an exchange on the chat. So please, uh, anyone having a question, uh, a question to, um, to the speakers, you can either do this by yeah, unmuting and asking directly or by just writing your question to the chat and we can pick it. So, if there is an immediate question to Ernesto and to Dimitris, please feel free to post it right now. Or we also have the Q&A, uh, so 10, 15 minutes in the end, where, of course, you can ask and uh, raise something. Let 
Thanks a lot, and and Beatrice, and maybe it makes sense to first continue with the other layers or security levels of colors. And then when uh, the complete picture, so to say, is shown, then people, please, everyone in the audience, feel free to jump in with any question about the security levels of these colors. And in the meantime, maybe um, let's move on with the second level already. Uh, I've seen Robert in the call. Maybe you can uh, then share your screen and proceed with level two, which is about resilience in smart factories. And you from side of Talis are managing work at um, four, which is about uh, three, uh, four, sorry, <laughs> which is about that. Yeah, thanks. So hello, can you see my slides? I try to... Yeah. Okay, I will try to. Um... Okay, I cannot see the video. Okay, uh, so uh, hello uh, everybody. So I am uh, Wafa. Uh, so I am a senior security uh, researcher at Tale Six GDS uh, France, and I am presenting uh, the resilience here in smart uh, factory, in particular, uh, the level uh, two security uh, package in uh, Collabs. That is, uh, I mean, the scope, let's say, of work package uh, three. Then after that, I will uh, present, uh, I will uh, give a brief uh, overview of the level two uh, secure uh, package in Collabs and the high level also uh, objective. Then after that, I will uh, proceed with the presentation of uh, a system that we are uh, currently developing uh, that is uh, integrating both uh, the ledger-based fine-grained authorization and the distributed, so it's a distributed ledger with a fine-grained authorization based on attribute-based uh, access uh, control. So for that, I will um, present a brief overview about uh, a crypto system that is the attribute-based encryption and decryption process. So uh, this is a crypto system when you need uh, to uh, generate encrypted data, we proceed with that uh, cryptographic uh, process. Then after that, I will uh, give a presentation uh, about the system description, what are the main actors and also the main uh, steps of the uh, algorithm. After that, I will uh, highlight or give a summary of the property of the system in terms of authorization, integrity, traceability that are guaranteed by uh, this uh, system. So uh, this is the collapse. What we see now is the collapse uh, high level architecture that is developed uh, in this uh, project. And it uh, actually, it's a comprehensive solution as we uh, might uh, know. So it includes uh, all, uh, I mean, security, uh, three security level from the first level has been uh, initially, I mean, uh, by my uh, colleague. So it's about the hardware enabled uh, and device level security uh, mechanism. And the scope of this level two is actually a level, uh, the, is security using device to device distributed uh, ledger. So uh, this is the uh, scope of uh, the, how, and how to guarantee, I mean, with this mechanism, how we could guarantee resilience in smart uh, factory. Then uh, after that, I am, um, uh, when we say uh, level two security, uh, we are wondering about uh, what are, what is about level two security. So this level two, Actually, uh, it uh, corresponds to all the information uh, exchanged among devices within the smart uh, factory. So for that, we use first, I mean, we leverage uh, the use of secure distributed blockchains that enhance uh, the availability of the security uh, component. And also they provide the traceability, provide also uh, the non-repudiation in order to ensure trust and an inter-device uh, collaboration. 
Then the second, uh, I mean, uh, level, we uh, leverage also a comprehensive and decentralized access uh, control. So we adopt here a decentralized access control scheme to ensure that all the data that is produced and all the action that are, uh, I mean, uh, produced, uh, also uh, the data produced from the connected object and all the action on this uh, connected uh, object are, uh, I mean, are granted access uh, using uh, an access control uh, policy. So all these within the smart uh, factory. And for that, we use a fine-grained authorization uh, scheme that is based, I will um, uh, describe it later, that is based on uh, attribute-based uh, access uh, control. Then after that, uh, we uh, leverage also a ledger-based uh, public key infrastructure to guarantee that all the communication channels are secured with respect to authenticity, integrity, and confidentiality. Then uh, the fourth uh, I mean, uh, key, uh, let's say, element of uh, level two uh, security package is to provide, uh, let's say, um, a mechanism for data sensitivity, in particular, using uh, or identifying uh, with uh, using machine learning based confidential uh, data discovery. So, uh, before I mean describing the system, it will be uh, important to introduce you uh, the, uh, the concept of uh, attribute based encryption and uh, decryption. So let us, uh, we have here in this uh, figure, uh, two, uh, I mean, two actors. The key authority here is uh, referred to key management uh, server or the sensor owner. And we have here two uh, sensors. The key owner, I mean, its role here is to generate specific attribute based encryption keys for these two uh, sensors. So sensor A here is uh, dedicated for, I mean, when you see beta and then classified are the attributes. So sensor A here is dedicated for beta operation and collects and classified, let's say data. This is one scenario. Then sensor B, uh, let's say here is dedicated for an operation called alpha and it collects secret data. So in order to generate a key for a sensor A and sensor B, so the encryption key here will be generated for sensor A using the attributes uh, of beta and unclassified. The secret key or the encryption key also for sensor B is generated with the attributes alpha and secret. So when we have the encrypted key for both sensor A and sensor B, then they can for sure encrypt using these generated encrypted uh, keys. So the data that is encrypted with these keys can only be decrypted by a key that have uh, with an access policy, that, uh, with an access policy, that is satisfied by a set of attributes. And this, um, I mean, in order to clarify this, let us introduce, uh, I mean, a concept uh, that is called a policy, access control policy. It's actually, uh, this is a tree that we saw here on the right, let's say right uh, uh, of this uh, figure. So we, it's a combination of different attributes that are necessary to decrypt a message. So here we have the different attributes are unclassified, confidential, alpha, beta, and that are OR and uh, XOR. So we use a logical uh, operation, either OR and uh, or XOR. I mean, it depends on the operation that you apply. This is the policy, and then when you uh, would like, I mean, uh, if someone would like to access, I mean, the data that is generated or produced by a specific sensor, 
it should check whether the uh, policy is satisfied or not. If the policy is satisfied with the given attributes that it has, then it will get access or it can decrypt the data. Otherwise, the, uh, I mean, the data will, could not be uh, accessed. I mean, could, uh, the reader could not decrypt the key. So uh, using this, I mean, this uh, policy, this is an example. If I have, if I am a reader, I would like to access the data that is stored or that is uh, the, the data that is generated by this sensor. If I have the attributes beta and unclassified, then in this case, if I would like to check this policy, for sure I can see that uh, this policy is uh, it's, uh, satisfied with the or given these two uh, attributes. So uh, this is with this policy. With this policy, if I also, uh, in order to illustrate another example, if I have the alpha and secret attributes and would like to access a sensor with using the same policy. So I can see that when I do uh, the end, uh, where if I would like to uh, test the policy using these two attributes, the policy, I mean, will not be uh, satisfied and then it will, uh, I cannot guarantee access to the data or the access is denied. So this is uh, the main uh, message, I mean, from, uh, so we have the encryption process, we have the generation of the data, uh, the generation, sorry, of the key, uh, of the attribute-based uh, encryption key, and also we have the decryption uh, process. So these uh, two fundamental, uh, I mean, uh, concepts. Then after that, I will um, present uh, with a brief overview also uh, the ledger-based fine-grained authorization in uh, Collabs, that is, um, is level uh, two uh, security. So we have, uh, it's uh, interesting to, uh, uh, to define the main uh, actor of our uh, system. So we have the sensor owner. We have an owner of these, uh, of different uh, sensor in one field. And uh, the uh, role of the, this uh, sensor owner is like a key management server that attributes, that generates key. Then we have also sensor uh, one and sensor two. I mean, this is example of sensor that are uh, deployed and where we deploy in the sensor, the attribute based encryption model. The attribute based, so the sensor will encrypt the data that they uh, produce. We have also a client uh, on the other side, the client here uh, that would like to access the data that are stored on the, uh, the data that are stored on the uh, system that are produced by these uh, sensor one and sensor two. Then also we have a message broker and this message broker is a file uh, where is an external uh, file where we store encrypted data. And then all these actor, all the exchange of uh, uh, messages or communication between these uh, actor of the architecture will be uh, mainly uh, the, uh, I mean, generated or uh, let's say by a blockchain where we have uh, different smart uh, contracts uh, where, uh, that they, uh, they're able either to store uh, some policies or uh, to store some messages or to do some uh, verification. So all what we uh, saw here on the blockchain are the smart uh, contracts. So in order to ensure uh, some properties of the blockchain that we might, will see that are some of them like the traceability or the integrity of uh, the communication. And so uh, here we have uh, for the beginning, uh, I mean, uh, as a first step, the client, what we'll uh, do, or uh, I mean, uh, for the first step, we have the sensor owner that will update uh, different keys, uh, will update the policies. The policy is the same as I referred before, is the access control uh, policy to uh, to.
access to a specific uh, sensor. Then after that, uh, we will uh, have uh, all the sensor will uh, receive their policy, will receive also their uh, keys. And then in the second step, we will have uh, the sensors uh, that uh, will store uh, the integrity of the message uh, in the blockchain uh, that we refer it to the hash message broker. And also it will uh, encrypt data uh, that are stored in the message broker. So this is the uh, second step. Then comes for the IoT certification authority that needs to uh, to do a check whether uh, to uh, to check the identity of the sensor that is stored. I mean, that is stored uh, by checking uh, both the message broker and the hash message uh, broker. So for now, uh, everything should work, I mean, uh, correct. And then when a client would like to access uh, the data that is stored in our uh, system, it needs only to download uh, the hash of the, uh, from the hash message uh, broker and also to download also the message uh, that is, uh, that is uh, the encrypted uh, message from the message broker. And then after that, we can uh, guarantee the access, I mean, uh, by uh, checking whether we can guarantee the access to the client or not. So this is, uh, let's say, a uh, high level description, uh, what we are uh, currently uh, working and what we uh, achieved in terms of different uh, property of uh, our uh, system. So uh, we provide, so let's say, a decentralized fine-grained authorization uh, framework using the blockchain technology system that provides integrity, provides also a traceability. And this distributed ledger of the blockchain, uh, it, it acts actually as uh, an immutable evidence uh, for all the transaction recorded uh, on it and also it provides uh, that let's say feature in terms of traceability for access control uh, related events and uh, then our system will ensure also using this ledger uh, based uh, mechanism that all the entities that uh, all the participating uh, entities uh, they it will assure for them that the data stored uh, and uh, cannot be modified, cannot be uh, tampered with, and those it will uh, enforce, uh, let's say, uh, the trust. So uh, this is mainly the properties of the system that we, um, we are uh, presenting. And uh, yes, and uh, I think uh, this is from my side. And uh, yes, uh, thanks for uh, your uh, attention. Hello. Yes. Thanks. Okay, Thanks yes. 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 You can as well. Um, I've just seen Tony post a question. I think this is a generic one to call ups. I think would it be okay, Tony, when we push this to the end when we have the okay. Q &A, uh, and then you get also the opportunity to see what is developed and how that can be distributed. Maybe that's already going in some uh, kind of direction you're you're asking. So, okay, thanks. So maybe then let me briefly continue with giving you, let me share my screen. Uh, also the overview about level three security package. I hope you can see it already. Uh, what is this all about? Let me mouse pointer. And then we can get started. Okay, so thanks to um, Ernesto, Dimitris, and Rubberhold already gave an overview about uh, level one and level two security of the Collapse project. And this is basically when we just map it to the architecture of an industrial site. Uh, those levels shown here, so secure connected objects, this is what level one security is aiming at and uh, resilience and smart factory this is just what um, 
Vava pointed out and described the technologies developed in this regard. What we have in addition with level three security are technologies coming in also, of course, building upon level one and level two, but trying to address also the upper layers of the purdue architecture of a typical industrial plant. Um, the level three is handled, level three security package, I have to say, is handled in work package two of the Collapse uh, project. And um, in total, we are having six different tasks focusing on different areas of expertise and technologies that will be developed. For the sake of time, please allow me to not make a deep dive into each and every task, but uh, I will rather consolidate it and describe the three main um, streams that are developed in this regard and pick out one in the end, which is also then later on shown in the demonstrator session. So basically when talking about level three security, you're having a stream which is so to say called secure data sharing. So across all the different layers of the Purdue architecture uh, in order to support collaborative and distributed um, processing of data and really working together collaboratively. We also have several tasks uh, working on a stream on machine and deep learning based approaches. For example, to identify anomalies that are going on on the network level or um, is, is there any question sorry um sorry for, and then uh, machine learning based approaches so a lot of activities are going on and i will as mentioned also pick out one sample component that is developed in this regard where later on uh, a small demo will be shown as well and last but not least, we have the so-called workflow-driven security framework. And this is going up to the business process layer or application layer, uh, which is needed to define and implement collaboration across organizations. Um, I will come to that point in, in a second. But maybe let's go through each and every stream step-by-step step and show you how that maps to the layers of the Purdue architecture and also what we are doing in this regard and how far we got. As Sergio mentioned in the beginning of the presentation or of today's workshop, that we, so to say, reached one third of the duration of the Collapse project. Lots of deliverables, lots of work has already been done, but I can also give you a brief outlook of what is happening. So let's start with secure data sharing, which is basically about um, having a look at what kind of data will be collected and processed and also distributed across the different layers of a network architecture or of a company's architecture. So the focus is on trustworthiness of data flow and collaborative manufacturing. And in order to tackle that topic, um, we first had a look at what is actually the data flow that has to take place. And for that also the pilots and the use cases which are handled by uh, Collapse have been analyzed and the different um, pieces of information that are collected, processed and pushed through the different layers have been identified and categorized. And based on that, um, an architectural framework for trustworthiness assurance has been developed. So the way we proceed and what has been achieved so far is, as mentioned, the identification of the data flows and of course also the data that is going to be processed and how that maps to the collapse use cases and scenarios. So the uh, three different use case providers with, uh, that Sanjar introduced in the beginning, having different, but also um, yeah, reoccurring scenarios like for example, remote maintenance or data processing in the cloud, for example. And because of that, really, uh, all the layers, so this is a good example of a stream where all the layers of a company's network structure have to be addressed and data has to flow across all of these layers before it's in the end, in extreme case processed, getting processed in the cloud. And uh, just to give you a um, bit of outlook of where we are and where we are aiming at, uh, so we are right now in the middle of the whole process with the development of the components, which are then orchestrated and put together to, 
to implement the framework which I just uh, mentioned. And um, over the time, both the framework needs to be up or will be updated. And also, of course, the components will get more and more mature so that we also reach a level uh, where uh, the components can be used for prototypical or first on-site deployments also in the context of the, collaborate, uh, of the collapse use case. So this is one important screen we are handling in level three layer security. Um, the second one, where also uh, a lot of different tasks, you can just see it here, highlighted in brackets, are focusing on. And those tasks are working on machine learning and deep learning based approaches to, for example, identify anomalies in network traffic or in system setups. Um, actually, we have in the stream uh, two main different um, directions. One is focusing on the digital supply network, uh, where really in the end data is collected and processed in the cloud. And there we really have this collaborative um, yeah, way of interaction where uh, data of one side is processed in the end by another party. And in order to achieve this and also to keep uh, corporate proprietary information still confidential, although it's processed in the cloud, um, approaches like homomorphic encryption are evaluated and trusted execution environments to make sure that only those people that require access or that are the owners of the data can really see the, data, the raw data in the end and that uh, you have full control of your confidential information. Um, on uh, the connected objects level, also a lot of activities are going on. I will come to in a second. Uh, there basically we have um, different approaches running like, for example, device identification and wireless fingerprinting. This is used in order to categorize and identify kinds of devices. And of course, in case something new gets hooked on to your infrastructure that you can see, okay, has this done by intent? Do you know about it? Or is there something uh, weird going on, some anomaly that has to be treated? Um, the same also happens on an intrusion detection uh, based approach for industrial IoT, where instead of running or doing the in, uh, analysis on backend uh, infrastructures, the IDS functionality, so to say, pushed down to the industrial IoT devices and locally analyzed and shared across uh, the IoT devices in a network. So uh, concerning the approach of what we are using for the different uh, topics in the stream, I already mentioned trusted execution environment and homomorphic encryption. Of course, lots of um, analytics, behavior, behavioral models have to be um, implemented, designed and implemented, and of course, tested and evaluated in the end. And uh, of course, the completely new decentralized architecture, in particular for the um, decentralized IDS approach, have to be uh, designed and evaluated. So, where we reached so far, and we will show this also later on in the brief demo session, um, a lot of, um, of course, test sets up has already been made, and uh, implementations have been done with regard to the different architectures uh, of the different layers, as well as data models and uh, analytics modeling has been needed. So again, the same holds true for all the three different streams and all uh, work package uh, as we are in one third in between of the collapse project, things will be further developed and get more and more mature and flow together, so to say, in the overall collapse framework. And the same, as mentioned, also applies to the third stream, which is about the workflow-driven security framework. That one basically addresses the fourth level of the project architecture, the supply network, and it is aiming at uh, collaborative environments, like, for example, one which we have in uh, the scenarios of remote maintenance, where different organizations, different parties, have to get access to your local site. And we are not by that addressing, so to say, the network layer and how this access is to be um, provided in the end, but more or less 
the application layer and the workflow layer on top of it. So let's say you have more or less a business process, which is defining how your remote maintenance scenario should and uh, needs to work and needs to be controlled. And that needs to be mapped to technical means for enforcing it in the end. And what we are applying here is on the one hand side, a modeling of this business process using common Petri-Nets based approach, which themselves sit on top of a distributed ledger technology. Um, by the way, distributed ledgers, they have been also before mentioned by Ernesto and by Rob as well. Uh, those technologies are um, highly used within Collapse in order to really mention and uh, manage trustworthiness across organizations, that organizations can have access to the same source of information, can share um, the trust in this distributed architecture. And uh, so far we reached uh, the point where uh, we also have the implementation of um, the, the component of the framework available, and we are currently in a way to integrate it in the collapse use cases and to develop it further in this regard. So for the sake of time, maybe let's jump across that one because this is just a summary of what I just mentioned. And we really give um, some kind of outlook or teaser of what is happening right after my presentation, where basically Dimitris and colleagues are giving an overview of the current status uh, that has been reached so far. And uh, we picked up one component that has been also developed in uh, level three layer security, which is about the machine learning based cognitive security framework. And as I mentioned, this is a machine learning based approach to classify and to detect, or better to say, to identify IoT devices in your network. And for that, the colleagues from Novisat are using um, yeah, attributes or aspects of wireless communication like radio channel condition parameters. Or you could also think of hardware related imperfections that can be used for that purpose, as well as the overall energy consumption, which is quite typical or often characteristic for specific devices. Those are, so to say, the input parameters. Um, the colleagues already have run a lot of experiments with really good uh, results about accuracy and also concerning speed. Um, on the right hand side, you just see a um, sketch of how this is set up on site and how um, the devices are interconnected in order to collect the data, transfer it basically also to a backend system and process it there. So uh, I'm more or less already now reached the end of my presentation. And uh, Dimitri, if okay for you, I would jump or directly hand over to you. Uh, so because um, that topic will then be picked up in your presentation, giving a summary and an overview about what has been achieved so far. So, yes. Thanks for your interest. And if okay for everyone, let's move and push the questions to, Q to the Q&A session and complete the presentation by, by Dimitris and uh, Valerio. Can you can you please stop sharing so I can uh, start sharing my screen? Thank you. Sorry, no, no <coughs> so uh, a short intro here. So what uh, the Collapse Framework uh, MVP aims are. Uh, just about uh, to detect and prevent threats, obviously, as already mentioned, on multiple layers in an industrial uh, environment, uh, ensure the integrity and compliance of data uh, that are uh, communicated and analyzed within the scope of uh, this project, these this, uh, efforts, to secure the process, of course, of, of remote maintenance of devices, as well as uh, enhance the security of IIoT, industrial IoT devices. Finally, we need and we target uh, to provide a state-of-the-art 
monitoring, assessment, and uh, visualization set of tools uh, in order to accommodate uh, the, the, the uh, engineers that uh, overview the process. What we have learned so far from, from the development process is that we have gained valuable insight about uh, the usability uh, of uh, the underdevelopment solution, uh, as well as the applicability for the specific use cases, uh, as well as uh, acquired the deep uh, level understanding of possibly reoccurring vulnerabilities in such an infrastructure. Uh, apart from uh, all, all things said up to now, and one other important aspect is that we have already established uh, the basement, the, the main functionality, uh, the integration uh, capabilities in, in order to proceed with further onboarding uh, of uh, modules and functionalities and capabilities within the Collapse Framework, uh, as uh, already mentioned uh, by Martin regarding the teaser that you're gonna see right after that. So allow me to not uh, stay uh, any, longer, any longer here and jump into the presentation uh, of the MVP framework, an actual uh, live presentation here. Uh, so this is the main dashboard of the Collabs MVP framework, um, which is basically built using uh, uh, mainly open source technologies. Uh, it is used, of course, to monitor and provide alerting about the infrastructure uh, comprising the Collabs Partners environment. And this environment, of course, includes the shop floor and the lab environments of the pilots. Uh, and the dashboard uh, provides a real-time view. This specific dashboard provides a real-time view of the events uh, gathered from the different devices already deployed. Uh, mentioning about devices, it can be anything from an IoT sensor and a Raspberry Pi to a Windows or a Linux server. In the upper left part, uh, you can see um, the categorization of the events captured up to now, uh, with the stacked bar representing the number of events received uh, per category. Uh, the categories can be uh, seen as logon failures or multiple logon failures, uh, success and uh, or possible application level errors or user logoffs. Um, in the upper right part, we can see uh, the orientation, the source of the events, uh, namely the channel that each event was received from. In the lower right part, the lower left part, we can see how, uh, how the number of events uh, evolves uh, during time and some more details about those events can be also uh, seen along with the timestamp on the lower right part. Uh, on the top, we can select to uh, have a quick view of what has happened during the past eight hours and see how these uh, uh, values and representation visualizations change dynamically or during the past day. Uh, or we can go even further to just one week back. But what happens if we want to uh, go even further back in time and investigate uh, possible anomalies, possible uh, issues uh, that have happened in the past in our infrastructure, in our monitor and protected infrastructure. So we uh, go for that reason in the events and uh, processes dashboard, which is actually uh, containing uh, information about infra similar uh, information about in our infrastructure on the um, Upper left part, we can see the evolution of the number of events received uh, from all subsystems, from all, all environments in our infrastructure. Uh, just, just as a count, on the upper right part, you can see again categorized uh, in, uh, in, in a segmented way all the different types of events. On the lower left part, uh, you can see <coughs> the categories of uh, IoT-related 
data received up to now. And the, on the lower left, uh, right part, you can see uh, the number of processes running uh, on our systems up to now. And during the last two months, as you can see on the, uh, on the upper part. So uh, what would be a good use case to, <clears throat> to uh, showcase here? We can see that we have two spikes here two spikes that might need further investigation. Uh, those two spikes might, somebody would think it might be some uh, related to an application error. So uh, why not select, click here, the application error event and see if this pat pattern persists, if this is related um, to what we have seen up to now. Actually, there is something like a spike here. Nevertheless, it's not on the date that we have observed the spike before. So yeah, most probably it's not, it's not uh, the root cause of what we have seen before. If we similarly select, obviously the most uh, uh, common event category, the most frequent one, yes, the pattern uh, remains. So this is the root cause of what uh, we have uh, observed up to now. Uh, again, uh, similarly, we can spot anomalies or spikes or uh, similar situations uh, on the lower part regarding the processes, or we can see that we still receive uh, what we expect to receive from our IoT devices on the lower left part. Uh, what if uh, we wanted to go into a deep dive into the details of the events? just to uh, allow for even further elaboration and even further investigation uh, of what is available. As uh, you can see, we can also do that. And that's the part that we said, it's already a, a good way to start uh, investigating on our infrastructure. We have different indexes uh, providing different capabilities for different sets of data collected. So let's assume that we want to investigate and fetch uh, data uh, received from the Raspberry Pi that we expect to do. So that's something that we can do that. We can see all the latest events received from a Raspberry Pi uh, dating back to the 13th of January uh, last week, actually. And we can see all the details of uh, uh, the data collected from this edge device. So another aspect uh, that uh, we can uh, refer to uh, and is already included in the MVP is the assurance uh, of the framework, which is actually <clears throat> ensuring the, that the Collapse framework is secure or actually its modules and sub-modules are built uh, on a secure way. So we have imported all our modules and sub-modules within this uh, security assurance platform, which is part of the Collapse MVP. And uh, this uh, is structured in a way that uh, the specific project and the uh, uh, has been assessed. So uh, let's go directly to save some time to the um, assessment results, the MVP assessment results. Uh, we can see that uh, a lot of assets, actually 112 assets have been identified as sub-modules within this uh, Collapse framework. Uh, assets being anything from, from a piece of software to hardware or even data, as you can see here. And the results of several um, vulnerability assessments is shown on the lower part of this uh, assurance platform. Uh, one complete uh, vulnerability assessment has been conducted uh, and we can see the results here. We have 200 high um, findings, 434 medium findings and 25 low findings. If we want to go uh, into more details about that, as you can see, the findings refer to um, both in, uh, to uh, several aspects of its assets, namely integrity, confidentiality, and availability. So let's keep it uh, fast. We can see some, some details about this finding or even go here. 
and see um, some more details about this specific sub-module uh, that was found as um, a finding within this uh, security uh, assessment. So uh, right now, let's go back to the presentation in order to show uh, the teaser of, of the efforts that are not yet integrated. Nevertheless, they are quite remarkable uh, results uh, there. So please. Uh, in Collapse, we collect wireless fingerprints in. Can you, can you hear the sound? Thank you. That's so. That, that's uh, our colleague uh, Milos Radovanovic from uh, uh, the University of Novi Sad. So uh, I shouldn't talk much. Three different wireless IoT scenarios. First two scenarios are based on Wi-Fi standard, while the third one is based on cellular IoT. For the first two scenarios, we already generated uh, initial data sets, while for the third one, the process of making data set is now in progress. First scenario is based on IEEE 802.11 AC standard. This standard can be used for industrial IoT, but we include it in our wireless fingerprint implementation mainly because of its popularity. Our system consists of a single access point and 33 uh, IEEE 802.11 AC devices where both transmitter and receiver are equipped with network card in order to get uh, channel state information values. Each of these devices has three antennas and from each of these antennas we can collect 56 different sub, sub carriers. So one row in our data set consists of uh, 100 68 row channel state information measurements and we define two different data set where one is based on magnitude of these complex values and the second one is based on its phase. The effect which we are using in the first scenario is now shown. As we already said we have one access point and that access point is represented with this device why? We have 33 transmitters and each of these transmitters are represented with this device. Each transmitter send 802.11 AC bytes. Now we will start the transmitter script which is used for sending the packets. We will send 1000 packets. The sending is done. Now we will start the receiver script, which is used for collecting the packets. The packets will be collected in demo collapse file. Now, the process of receiving the packets is done. The second scenario is based on IEEE 802.11 AH Wi-Fi standard. We decided to use this standard in our wireless fingerprinting implementation because this standard will likely dominate in deployment of Wi-Fi based industrial IoT networks in coming years. In order to generate a fingerprinting data set, we use a part of a packet which is always the same, which means that we use a preamble. And in order to collect necessary data, we again have the same setup as for the first scenario, which means that we have one access point and 33 IEEE 802.11 AH based devices. From each of these devices, we send 1000 preambles to access point and at the receiver side, we collect the raw data after downsampling and filtering. So, our data set consists of approximately 33,000 rows, where one row consists of preamble of received packet. Here we can see the equipment which we are used for the second scenario. In the second scenario, we have IEEE 802.11 AH based devices, so both the access point and the transmitters are represented with USRP B210 software defined radio platforms, which are connected to the PC, both transmitter and receiver. 
The third scenario is based on a slightly different technology than the first two because in the third scenario we used 3GPP MB IoT technology. Again, we have 33 MB IoT based devices which communicate now with mobile operator base station and these base stations are placed around the building. The process of making the third data set is now in progress. In the third scenario, we used our custom designed MBIFT nodes, and such nodes must communicate with mobile operator base station. As we already said, the process of making the third dataset is now in progress. In collapse, we collapse. In collapse, we. So, uh, this is it uh, from my side. Uh, I don't know. I, I guess all the questions can be addressed within the Q and A section. Uh, but of course, uh, at your uh, disposal. Thanks, Dimitris. And yeah, also because of the time, you just uh, showed that uh, of course the demo would have been continued. There's more to show. But maybe for the sake of time, um, let's move over to Valerio. Um, Valerio, you could give more information about the pilots that have already been mentioned for several times and to bring it all together how the technologies developed within Colops will be used in industrial sites in the end. So maybe Valerio, if I can hand over to you. And thanks, Images, for this thorough and deep going presentation. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Martin. Uh, as you said, this last uh, session was meant to recover a bit um, the connection with the pilots. Um, uh, this is, let's say, summarizing the work we are doing with Package 6 for preparation of the pilots to host uh, different technologies from Collapse. Um, participants of this workshop have seen already this slide presented at the beginning, so I won't spend much time on it. It gives uh, the overview of uh, the three uh, scenarios that we have been uh, we are looking into: uh, aerospace manufacturing, uh, consumer electronics, and uh, automotive uh, domain. Um, let's say, uh, following up to this, uh, there's a bit more uh, details uh, related to the challenges and and what we are uh, say bringing into the project. This is the scenario uh, coming from Raytheon Technologies and in particular Pratt & Whitney. Uh, let's say Pratt & Whitney is a manufacturer of jet engines for civil and def defense applications. Um, let's say here you see a high level description of, the, of a simplified infrastructure with the shop floor layer uh, manufacturing zone uh, in, uh, in charge of uh, coordination and um, let's say operation of all the shop floor machine and the enterprise part, as well as uh, uh, let's say connection to other partners in the supply chain, as well as other uh, sites. Um, this is a similar infrastructure that is uh, also in place in other, uh, in other pilots where uh, all of the scenarios also considered collaboration needs and integration needs. Here we highlight the three challenges. One is remote maintenance. So this is a, a problem that is raising more and more for a reduction of cost, a reduction of time of reaction, as well as for minimizing the time downtime of the plant. There is a need of giving remote access to companies providing maintenance to uh, equipment and, uh, for example, tips that work uh, on materials. Um, clearly, this uh, opening up to this link is very um, challenging in terms of security, and we really want to um, make sure that uh, this uh, connection is as much as possible automated, kept uh, uh, consistently managed in terms of authorization and access control across all devices and all uh, uh, infrastructures, and uh, really providing minimal and uh, a fine grain uh, control over what data is accessed, including the fact that we want to protect any IPT, IPC sensitive data that is collected in machines. The other scenario on the left regards the supply chain. As you know, 
uh, complex systems are uh, developed uh, through collaboration of different uh, companies uh, uh, in the supply chain producing different parts uh, and that are uh, integrated into a single the final product so uh, as with this, the progress to digitalization of the uh, supply chain, uh, all transactions need to be uh, secured and guarantee um, uh, data access only to allowed partners, as well as support uh, um, uh, auditability for uh, uh, any third party uh, entity that is authorized and in charge of checking that standard uh, compliance is followed in all the, in all the, in all the process. So this kind of scenario it's very important for us, uh, for all the cybersecurity challenges that poses. Final, finally, uh, always related to par parts compliance, typically when we produce uh, uh, complex parts, uh, um, uh, there is a lot of data uh, coming out of the production process. This data, uh, for example, includes uh, the visual, uh, visual imaging uh, that supports parts inspection. All of this may be processed on a cloud-based environment, and this is not the, the only case, use case where we involve cloud-based cloud -based architectures, but uh, they pose a, a big risk in terms of access, uh, who has really access to the sensitive data, if uh, data can be, um, is, uh, integrity can be guaranteed and so on. So these are the kind of challenges. Uh, you've seen that there have been uh, presented several technologies that address this, these challenges, similar uh, uh, let's say similar approach is done for the uh, for the side from the side of Philips. So here I'm, I'm reporting a little bit of uh, let's say the uh, information about this uh, use case. Uh, the interest is in, in some protection of machines in the shop floor, uh, which enable uh, uh, continued production and uh, availability of uh, of the plant. Uh, there is a, a big challenge of integration between the OT and IT world, as you have seen uh, uh, discussed in many points in this uh, workshop. And uh, let's say the main two challenges are really protection uh, by prevention and detection of uh, endpoints from, uh, from threats. Uh, in an approach that, uh, uh, that can be uh, evolved uh, in time, not only in terms of the capability of threat detection and, uh, let's say, uh, uh, prevention, but as well as in terms of uh, um, uh, how uh, the, the, the topology of the uh, network infrastructure is evolved in time for all the needs of uh, uh, reorganization of the factory. And the second part, which was touched upon several in several points from the beginning of this workshop, the need of collecting data from production to monitor performance, uh, optimize the process, identify upcoming failures, and all of this uh, data should be collected, uh, maintained uh, securely, as well as provided access to appropriate uh, parties. The third. Uh, the third scenario comes from the automotive sector with Renault. Uh, they also are bringing a very complex infrastructure, uh, in allowing uh, factories from all the uh, from from globally Europe uh, to co collaborate and uh, uh, support um, global uh, manufacturing. There are four challenges in here that uh, have been brought and are are taken uh, by the consortium. Uh, the first one is, uh, let's say, again, allowing remote uh, maintenance, remote configuration of all the infrastructure in a secure manner. The second uh, challenge pertains uh, uh, to collection of data from all the stages of manufacturing to perform uh, predictive uh, maintenance and uh, optimization. Clearly here, uh, we are, we're touching upon uh, challenges about connectivity, segregation of access and fine grain access control. Uh, the third challenge pertains to assets management. Uh, we all know that uh, these big infrastructures uh, are also physically accessed by many persons. Uh, there are continuous um, uh, physical reconfiguration of the network, addition of, uh, let's say, uh, new devices. And so being able to continuously manage assets in the network and their security posture, so any vulnerability or any misconfiguration is essential to keep uh, um, 
of the overall infrastructure security uh, up to the standard. Uh, the final challenge is about how to enrich uh, low cost uh, IoT devices and industrial controllers that may be legacy or very low power with uh, uh, capability to perform trusted computations. So we've seen some of these touched upon by Infineon with uh, uh, hardware components, but as well as several other technologies. Another highlight that I wanted to, uh, to give is that uh, in the context of Collab, Collabs, Renault is building up uh, a very uh, large uh, experimentation laboratory for IMDC 4.0 cybersecurity. Uh, they identify the location uh, near the Paris and it's a, a really big uh, uh, big site where uh, not only uh, concept uh, demonstration but real uh, demonstration can be performed with real uh, industrial machinery. Um, the infrastructure uh, that is being set up is uh, very modern, let's say uh, up to the uh, most recent uh, guidelines and best practices. So this will be uh, besides the other two uh, scenarios uh, from, from Philips and Raytheon that are also supporting demonstration, but this, this will be the largest scale uh, demonstration setup for collabs. So, Martin, I think with this, uh, I, I'm happy to end this, uh, uh, this uh, slot. Thank you for uh, support. Um, I'm open to any question. Thanks, Valerio. I think we are good in time, so um, we have some more minutes left now to address any Q, uh, any questions coming up to, as you call it, the collapse technology. So we had different presentations on different work packages focusing on components that are developed. We have seen from Dimitris the current state of the implementation and um, the framework that will be built up by these components and Valerio, thanks to you, who gave an overview of the pilots of where they will be evaluated. Um, I've seen, not sure if I missed anything, but I've seen some questions coming in in parallel on the chat. I'm not sure, uh, could be that some of them have already been answered. I think Tony asked a question about uh, what kind of distributed uh, ledger technology we are using. Um, and in fact, um, different partners in Collabs are using uh, basically uh, distributed ledger technology, so blockchain in concrete. And it looks like there has been some consensus uh, before the project already started. So uh, anyone, as far as I'm aware of, is using Hyperledger Fabric. Uh, so there is also good compatibility in regard to that platform. Um, but I think Davide already answered that question from um, which kind of technology will be used there. Hello, I'm uh, Ernesto from IFAG, from Infinium. Yes, I would please. like to add some detail to the David answer. We are using two, the um, Ethereum virtual machine that is uh, in the Hyperledger Fabric. It's a tool that allows us to work with Hyperledger Fabric like we were using Ethereum to use Solidity. Okay, for the smart contract. Okay. Hmm. Um, any further questions in particular to DLT, to distributed ledger technology? If not, then maybe any further question that comes in. I think um, there's also been one with regard to what kind of Deliver deliverable will there be in the end from side of columns? I'm not sure if I got that question right. So it's something uh, going in the direction of would it be code? Would it be open source or is it commercial software? Um, I'm not sure maybe Tony, that was also from your side, maybe you can repeat it. Um, but maybe in the meantime, what I can tell you is, of course it's a EU funded project. So it's a research project. Um, there will be different kinds of deliverables um, due to that, of course, and they will be made public also, of course. Uh, so deliverables means that the technologies, the technology used and implemented, um, so the know-how, so to say, will be made public also based on the different deliverable 
questions you can find on the Collapse website. We had just uh, reached more or less one third of the duration of the project. So um, there is, of course, much more to come. And that also means with regard to the software. So of course we have different owners of the software, of the components that will be developed and evaluated. And I think Valeria, you, you already mentioned in the chat, if you're interested in that, uh, always good to reach out to the Collapse team as such. Uh, I think you have shared the information about where to find us uh, on the web or also on our Facebook. So if there are any questions with regard to concrete deliverables, whether you want to try out something or whether you also want to join um, and follow the project, please feel free to always reach out um, to us via, for example, LinkedIn or, or Facebook. Okay, and I think Tony just brought up another question in, uh, asking and as to you, what benefit is there in using a public blockchain versus a private one? Well, right now, Ethereum is like uh, similar, like a standard where we are talking about uh, smart contracts in blockchain. So for us, it's advantage if we can um, may, uh, develop our smart contracts in uh, in a compatible in a compatible way with uh, with Ethereum, because for example, maybe we want to change in the future to Quorum, and in this way we can reuse the same smart contracts or for any other purposes. I'm not sure maybe question to you, Valeria. Is it possible for everyone to jump in with questions via um, via voice, via audio as well? Or can people uh, from the attendees list only post it to the chat? That's more or less. Yes, Martin, thanks. Uh, honestly, there is a bit of uh, uncertainty about this uh, from my side. Um, it's it's the first time that I use this uh, Zoom for uh, workshop uh, infrastructure. We've, we've done a few trials, um, but um, I think that we have two options here. One is to uh, participants for participants to host the to to post the question on the chat or to raise their hand and we can give them uh, let's say uh, the ability to speak and so on so anyone who wants to raise any question please raise your hand or or feel free as as many has done uh, to post a question on the chat and maybe now just a quick uh, yeah kind of summary also from my side as uh, we've come to the end of the collapse technology session i think that nicely follows up on the industrial panel, which we just had before, uh, together with Ekbalian and Erin. And um, as we already mentioned, I think the Collapsed um, project, as it is a research project, this is a bit more, bit more forward looking. So uh, Ekbalian, you brought up very important and good aspects about what solutions are needed immediately right now for uh, companies in particular for small and medium-sized ones um, and just to, to bring this picture together and I hope you uh, agree in this regard is the technologies we are trying out and developing in the context of collapse are of course also evaluated in industrial context or industrial sites but a bit more um, yeah horizon one or two years or even more years ahead of today um, so not yet production production grade or not yet in use right now. So I think talking about industrial IoT, uh, at least from my personal point of view, we have topics to address right now, which was addressed in the previous um, panel in particular, and good uh, possibilities to tackle that were shown there. And some things we are thinking of and evaluating in the context of the Collapse project a bit more uh, for the future. I hope you, you agree, or maybe any thoughts from your side, Professor Saul? I have to unmute first. Well, I learned one thing in a factory environment. Um, 
it's very easy to make things rather complicated and it is extremely difficult to make it as simple as possible but particularly in a factory environment it are the the most simple solutions which are effective and which ultimately will be uh, accepted and uh, so it's not easy to make something simple um, I, I, but i'm rather afraid that the education level uh, at the factory floor is not the level as you can find back in, uh, in an IT environment. So that's why I stress this uh, thing, try to keep the production line uh, automation or at least the digitalization of it and all the things happening there as simple uh, as possible um, and, and do all the more complicated things in the environments where you do have skilled people uh, who can deal with it. Uh, Exactly. And I can say, Martin, that uh, <clears throat> some efforts in Collabs are really going towards automation and uh, making transparent the cybersecurity process to manage the infrastructure. So I think going towards um, what are these um, inputs from uh, Professor Sol, I think. Thanks a lot. Um, just looking at the time, I think in the very you just brought up also the agenda. Um, we more or less are already somewhere in the middle of our short break. <laughs> we have a very short break, but uh, what are your thoughts, Valeria? Shall we uh, take uh, one very quick one just to get some fresh coffee or uh, uh, to, to make a brief refresh and then get back and continue uh, with the invited talk from side of Matthias. Thanks, Matthias, who will give us then a presentation about the um, Sequoia project, which is closely from the topic point of view uh, related to, to Collapse as well. And it's good to get your view and your um, details on your approaches used as well. So, Valerio, shall we proceed that way and make a quick, maybe a bit more reduced break now? Sure, yes. Also considering that the last uh, session about uh, the open discussion is a bit free, so um, there will be polls, uh, people can uh, uh, answer to our questions, and there will be a little bit interactive. So it, it also allows us to, to, uh, to say, be more flexible. So yes, maybe one minute and we start. <laughs> Okay, let me uh, welcome uh, Matthias Hiller from Fraunhofer Isaac. He, thanks for accepting this invitation uh, to present um, uh, Sequoia. It's uh, really our, uh, say, cousin project, <laughs> I say, uh, under the same uh, hat from uh, European Commission. So uh, thanks, Matthias. So Valerio, thanks for the introduction. Hello everyone on behalf of the Sequoia team. So you're yeah, working on the same on the same topic somehow and also um, maybe with some points you, you also already covered in, in this talk but also maybe some um, new perspectives on, on things. So I'm very happy to, to be here and also looking forward to, to the discussion session afterwards to, to see maybe where do we see things very similarly or also 
look at things in, in different flavors. So as an, as an overview over the Sequoia project, um, of course, we're also looking into collaborative manufacturing. And as three manufacturing use cases, we um, are looking into, we have the aerospace manufacturing by Airbus. We have automotive manufacturing with Conti and also um, maritime naval manufacturing with Naval. And um, the idea is to, to bring things from the technology down to the users and um, look into different vari variations of collaboration. So, so that we look in, into different types of collaboration um, with machine to machine, machine to human, and human to human um, collaboration on shop floor level, where we have the direct interaction, but also making sure to have the organization to organization collaboration um, and um, how to exchange data between different stakeholders and organizations and make that secure. And um, what came, also comes together is to um, bring security aspects and process safety aspects together so that the um, say or the many things are in place in the IT world, um, but the OT world all, doesn't need them also, um, what, which was in the discussion just previously, how to deal with the, the aspect of um, securing OT environments or, and how to interact with the IT world. And here we, we try to bring things from IT down to OT. And as duration, we chose to, to make it a bit shorter um, so that we, we have a two and a half year project here. As an overview of the partners, so we have um, yeah, German partners, French partners from Portugal, Finland, Belgium, um, Spain, Netherlands, across the, the EU, and also looking at different technical expertises. So for example, with partners from OT security, artificial intelligence, hardware security, um, also legals partner, collaborative robotics, so to, to cover different technologies. And um, what is our interpretation of collaborative manufacturing? So that is the typical process flow you have in a collaborative or in a, in a typical environment, you have a, a supplier who, who provides some sort of goods. And the next step, you have the engineering contractors um, that also support that. You have the manufacturer that actually assembles things in the lab. And then you forward the product from the, the manufacturer to the customer. And kind of that that's the analog flow. And now the idea is to also look into digital twins on the different levels. So to um, have digital twins on a machine level and on a product level to make sure that um, yeah, you don't only cover the, the manufacturing chain itself, but also the, the properties of the manufactured products and that the that is grouped under the collaborative manufacturing service provider here in the center and that this collaborative manufacturing covers several different aspects and um, that we're looking into the connection between the, the physical and the IT world and um, how do we address the constraints of the physical world and maybe also technologies from the IT world and how can we bring that together. So as um, already on the first slide, uh, we're looking into the different levels of collaboration and their different aspects. So for example, um, where you have specific lightweight aspects on the machine level, also the, the human machine interaction is challenging or um, on, a, on a human layer, how to, to authenticate pe people, for example, and then also spend that from the, across the different organizations and bring it from, yeah, from the, abstract process level down to the shop floor. Concerning the use cases, we have three use cases and every use case also is connected with a misuse case. So in aerospace manufacturing, um, the, the content or the, the collaborative sites are um, in Tablada, San, Plato and, and San Pablo and Cadiz, so Spanish Airbus factories. And um, 
here the we have a lot of interaction between industrial control systems and the the backend system. So, um, for example, the the robo shave as a metal processing machine or autoclave as as large ovens to to bake parts or or gap guns as mobile tools. The idea is you have um, the the industrial environment. Then you have a, a local gateway connected closely to the um, industrial control systems, and then you you go to a more IT-based platform with a, a server somewhere, and then ERP systems, data lakes, and the systems on top. And um, the the misuse cases, for example, one is looking into insider threats, how to insert um, rogue IoT devices, for example that that will misbehave um, or for example um, with malware or also looking into adversarial machine learning how to the the machine learning and um, attack detection for example could be fooled and um, and always the the different um, topics covered um, are linked with a key capability so for example to maintain the information security and we have a cloud secure cloud manufacturing backbone, um, also an OT security operation center, which we are working on so to, to bring the security operation center from the IT world to the OT. And for example, also having ad adversarial and robust AI. Um, in the maritime use case in the factory of Lorient, um, their remote maintenance and remote access is the scenario, and the um, the misuse case is to to bring in ransomware over this interface into the manufacturing environment, so that you have the the remote monitoring and maintenance, and underlying either to to bring in corrupted devices or also bring in malware. Um, and here it's important um, um, to also look into cyber ranges, um, where we also have a work package on, on preparedness, which is looking into cyber ranges. So, so to bring the training from the cyber range to the OT environment, and also to enable um, OT security forensics. So to, to also monitor the, the underlying network and, and in case something went wrong to at least see what was going wrong and, and learn from it and or maybe also track um, effects of the attacker. And uh, um, hmm, somehow I skipped the automotive use case. So the automotive use case is with a um, Conti um, production plant near Frankfurt. And the, the use case here is that um, during automotive manufacturing, and the integration of different components, several parties want to inject cryptographic keys so that you have, for example, different chip su suppliers, different OEMs, um, also internal keys, and all these keys are brought together and have to be put into the device. And, um, and how to look into this cloud access and look into the data exchange here. So, which also combines the, the information security aspects and also um, to, to learn with the cyber range how to do that. And here, um, the misuse case is looking into Byzantine Falls, um, where you, you're looking into um, creating inconsistent states and, and also have man in the middle attacks, which are en enabled here. And as a use case that is, goes across the different use case scenarios, we're also looking into robotics. Um, or collaborative robotics. So with, with two, two aspects here, first of all, having lone worker protection um, to make sure that if a single worker is working somewhere um, to, to protect this worker, but also um, to learn from these workers and then also actively be involved in, in the manufacturing process with the, the robots. And um, for example, to, to mix areas where the robots are, or operating and also where humans are, are operating. And um, for example, that here machine learning and specifically adversarial machine learning is a topic. And that this use case applies to, to all three other ones as these robots could be used in, in all these three use cases. So 
moving things or if you, you're looking into the, the use cases, we have challenges and we have capacities. Um, so the, the challenges are, um, first of all, to, to identify and prevent, to, to make sure or to, to identify threats and also having training and awareness to, to prevent um, attacks or, or, for example, train the, the users to, to make sure or to, to detect the attacks. Um, then also to, to protect the underlying system, that that's, that's an important part. And uh, the last one is in case of, or to make sure that you can detect incidents and also um, to react to them properly. And as these are more technical domains, also we have a legal part kind of as an under, as a, on the surrounding af um, aspect that we make sure to, to also co cover legal aspects here. And if you, you look into the, the challenges, they map directly map to capacities so that the identification and prevention that this can be done in a cyber range and um, the, the maybe specifics here in the cyber range are that also to involve OT systems and to, to have interfaces to um, ideally even the, the physical world to make sure that you, you can um, have access to, to real machinery and connect to them. And um, for the collaborative manufacturing backbone, we go through different layers so that we have the industrial IoT authentication and encryption at the lowest level, then also look into the connection between the workers and the, the IoT devices, and then have also fine-grained access control, which is more bound to the clouds here in the, the collaborative manufacturing backbone. And for the um, operation center, looking also at the, the OT aspects, here's also to the, the goal to bring things from the, the IT security world and bring them down to, to OT. Um, this is brought down into, into um, 16 key capabilities, looking at different layers. So, and the, the idea is to, to look into the different different layers and um, different capabilities and address each one with a, with a technical um, task. Um, and to, to give you an overview here over the, the functional architecture of the project, so with the collaborative manufacturing value, value chain that's in the, the center of our activities, and then we look into the different capacities um, or, or challenges dedicated to a work package. So for the, the work package four with the preparedness, um, the, the idea is to, to train or to, to test ITF, um, the, the OT environments create digital twins and have the, the community training here to make sure that the, the um, cyber range is able to, to represent the physical system and also to, to train the, the, under, um, the people using it. With the um, manufacturing backbone and the collaboration on, on top, of focusing on information security, we, we go from IoT over the user to, to the um, cloud environment with a fine-grained access control and also with this um, system, uh, security operation center. Um, we also cover the, the chain from having the um, OT incidents um, detection system and then having the, the human machine behavior and um, and also to react to it. So to, to um, collect, collect the information and have a collaborative um, response here and looking and under and as underlying technologies for the accountability framework. Um, on the more technical side, we have the adversarial and robust AI to um, either being able to detect attacks on the one hand and also having um, developing robust mechanisms that are actually robust against the, the adversarial work. Um, also bringing forensics from the IT world to the OT world 
is something we're looking into. So for example, what features do you need down in the, the OT devices to, to enable forensics and create the information necessary forensics and also create that in, in a trustworthy way and link that with uh, the underlying device. And from a le really legal perspective also that we, we need a legal, a legal framework here, how this can be, be addressed. And we're looking into different impacts. So um, from, from a scientific over the technological, operational over to the economic world, so that each of the, the tasks also linked to, a, to an impact. So from specific technologies, looking, for example, at IoT authentication based on physical and clinical functions, um, also the, the topic where I'm working on personally, um, and then going over AI and then having the cyber ranges as technological um, assets here, for example, and bringing things from the IT to the OT world. Here, it's important to to also look into the training, training, and also having the um, making sure to to train the person people in, involved in the environments on on security. And um, and also having the, the operation center and um, bring the, the detection capabilities from the IT world to the OT down there. And um, also, for example, if you, you need um, the, the framework on the legal side and then also to, to develop business models so that that brings goes over the, the different ways or different dom domains and, and how collaborative manufacturing can, can impact our, um, our industry. As a, as a project schedule, we, we are also, or we started a month earlier, I think, than, than you did. And now we are in a, um, about about half time we we had um two two workshops in november also um where valerio presented collabs um again thanks for that it was very nice to, to have you there and um that you you presented the the collabs view on collaborative manufacturing and that we we will have two more workshops now over the next months and um, kind of right now we are in the development of the technologies and then we'll go to, to validation and bring things into the use cases here. And also, yeah, right now close to a, to a um, commission review right now. And um, well, yeah, that's it from my side. Um, I hope I was able to, to give you some additional um, food for thought maybe um, and a, second view on collaborative manufacturing and happy to to stay with with you and um answer questions if you, if you have any thanks thank you very much matthias it was a very very interesting overview of collapse uh, sorry of uh, uh, sequoia and the connection to collapse as you said at the beginning is extremely um let's say evident um, so uh, actually also perf perfect timing, uh, delivering a lot of content, but also <laughs> in uh, this uh, uh, tight uh, schedule. So <clears throat> the next, uh, um, let's say, uh, the next thought discussion was thought between Martin and myself in this way. We had prepared the little polls to, um, to collect the questions from attendees um, and then uh, we could um, leave um, some time for open uh, discussion if you agree um, uh, I would say that uh, uh, again for any question from the attendees uh, uh, please uh, write write them on your uh, on this uh, chat uh, available chat and we will be happy to um, pause it on your behalf. Um, sorry, I, I wanted to share uh, 
this presentation. So time for feedback. <laughs> um, and a little also interactive uh, discussion. Um, so as I said, uh, we've been thinking about four polls uh, just to, to get a grip of uh, background and interest from the audience. Uh, some relevance and prioritization of collapse challenges. I think this would be a very good ground for uh, shared discussion, Matthias, also with you and on, on, on what uh, Sequoia is uh, considering. Um, then a third poll on preference and prioritization uh, concerning different solutions that we are posing in collapse uh, at different layers. Um, and finally, um, an overall uh, feedback on this event and the project, if there is interest to keep connected. So, uh, so this is the first poll. Uh, these are the questions so you should be, uh, you should see appearing uh, shortly a poll panel in your uh, screen. Uh, feel free to answer. Uh, there's uh, questions uh, really ranging from your, aff your affiliation, uh, fields of interest. Um, how did you become aware of ICSAC? Uh, and uh, if you know, if you knew about the Collapse project before or not, uh, uh, this, all of this will uh, give us um, uh, really a better grip on who you are like a driver license or <laughs> identity card from uh, this, uh, this attendance uh, list. I see already some results. At the end of the poll, uh, we will be happy to share with you also uh, the results of, uh, of the voting um, so that we also, you also get a grip of, uh, of who is also attending to this, uh, this poll and this event. Um, if you are unable to find uh, uh, the poll, you should see a notification down in your uh, um, toolbar below where you can access the poll. Uh, oops. Yeah, there's, I'm having some issues with the infrastructure because uh, it was uh, stopped. Uh, sorry, um, we, are, we are testing this. We have been testing this in the, in the past and uh, we are testing this live again. <laughs> so uh, you should have again the notification for polling. So feel free to participate. Uh, okay. If you have any troubles, please uh, share by the chat. Paul is uh, totally anonymous, so we don't have uh, an information about who you are. Uh, it will just uh, give us information about numbers, numbers of people voting for different uh, solutions. So don't worry into giving your uh, uh, your feedback. So uh, so for this poll, we had uh, this initial result. I'm sharing it with you. Uh, there has been uh, not very much participation. So please feel free to uh, give your feedback. There is um, attendance from uh, product vendors or consultancy, large companies. There is attendance also from small and medium enterprises and a little attendance also from uh, research. It's uh, a, a fragment of participants actually because uh, there's only three answers for this first question. Um, in, uh, instead, concerning a main, main field of interest, there is a, a majority of interest in IT security. Um, uh, Okay, and um, there's uh, um, some interest. Uh, so yeah, most uh, people uh, became aware of ICSAC uh, uh, from agenda, the IBIC agenda. 
and some of them from a collabs website and advertisement we did in the in the social media. Um, we are happy to find out that this workshop was healthy was help, help, helpful to uh, get more people to know about collapse um, uh, because uh, because it's cl clearly uh, okay I see some feedback from Ulrich uh, not all polls results are correctly presented sorry this is really live <laughs> live testing this infrastructure let's try with the second poll the second poll will be a bit more about uh, what we present in terms of uh, uh, collapse challenges so you'll see two questions uh, launch polling now uh, and i'll take a little bit more time for a collection of all the the, the answers from you you should be able to see this uh, new poll uh, in this slide you see the questions uh, the first one um, is about uh, what are the most important industrial IoT cybersecurity needs, in your opinion, uh, ranging from threat detection and prevention of the shop floor level, uh, control and secure remote maintenance, uh, assets uh, management and continuous assessment, securing embedded devices, uh, controllers and smart sensors, uh, data protection on cloud-based architectures, accountability and data protection in the supply chain, um, data protection for manufacturing data collected in the supply chain, again, uh, or a uh, non-listed cybersecurity need. It could be well the case that uh, uh, we are not covering. And actually, um, Sequoia presentation was very interesting in this uh, perspective. Uh, I'll leave this uh, poll uh, open for a while. Uh, <clears throat> there is uh, also a second question about uh, what are the most relevant classes of risks in Industry 4.0? Um, loss of data, lo uh, information disclosure, uh, denial of service or reduction in infrastructure resilience, uh, repudiation or no accountability in uh, transactions, uh, inconsistently managed uh, authorizations and other cyber, uh, cybersecurity setting, settings, um, a lack of visibility of assets in the infrastructure and lack of visibility of assets vulnerabilities. Uh, in the end, also products quality compromise, and this includes for sure any uh, safety related effects so for safety critical systems like uh, cars or engines or parts for uh, any safety critical uh, product uh, it's important uh, so it, this is this can be a challenging very important threat i'm happy that uh, not only uh, attendees but also panelists are participating uh, any information any opinion or contribution is extremely valuable here. Martin, if you have any comment here, feel free to jump in, uh, let's say. So far we have uh, had uh, sort of uh, close to 50% participation to the polls. Yeah, and I could just ask, uh, everyone should answer the poll. So yeah, please, this is an open poll. So uh, also panelists, please. Please feel free to give us your view. Yes, yes. And let's say um, your uh, feedback is going to be very important also for the continuation of our project. So uh, feel free to uh, so take your time and, and uh, give us uh, feedback here. It's going to be very, very valuable for us. Okay. Okay, thanks. Uh, and that's very good point. Uh, uh, Ulrich is, uh, is sharing his thoughts about uh, Question one, which are the most important as IoT services needs 
and he mentions training education. I think it's very, very important. And this was also emerging from uh, uh, Egberian uh, presentation. So lack of um, uh, understanding or skills uh, in people directly involved in the infrastructure is ex extremely, uh, is a very important gap. And a second uh, feedback from Ulrich, again, thank, thanks, uh, is, uh, uh, let's say, uh, on, on the second question, what are the most relevant classes of risk in Industry 4.0? Uh, he mentioned continuity, continuity, resilience, and data integrity, mentioning malware, ransomware, distributed denial of services. Uh, yes, that's a very important point. Uh, totally agree. Uh, it's partly covered by answer two, I think, denial of service or reduction of infrastructure resilience. Uh, but yes, uh, uh, yeah, and Tony is asking us to, uh, to uh, request everyone to share their thoughts to, to the entire chat, not only the panelists. When you uh, send out uh, uh, when you send out a chat, you can select uh, uh, the recipients. So if you choose all panelists and attendees, uh, you will reach everyone in the in the participants. So thanks, uh, thanks, uh, Tony. So uh, let me end this polling session and share with you the results. I think it's uh, very interesting. Uh, uh, what we see is that um, for the quest first question, there has been uh, a broad coverage of all the topics in the sense that uh, there is no uh, outstanding one uh, with a large advantage. Or of, of course, embedded devices, uh, uh, security embedded devices is one of the important, one of the most important points together with the threat detection and prevention on the shop floor and data protection in cloud-based architectures. Uh, we also recognize these as, as very important points uh, and we are working towards uh, uh, addressing these in different scenarios. Uh, Martin, feel free to comment yourself as well as we, as we get uh, these results. Uh, No, thanks. Um, nothing to add from my side. Basically, it really shows that there is no, yeah, um, previous and far, so to say, no one that excels, as you just pointed out, but uh, it's really different aspects that need to be handled. This is my kind of summary. Um, in parallel and multiple different aspects have to be, be addressed by projects which we're talking about, be it Sequoia or Collins. But that's also very, very helpful for us to get your view on that. And thanks to everyone participating in this poll. Thank you. Yes, concerning the uh, the risks, uh, I think here, Martin, there is a lot of uh, focus on uh, uh, infrastructure uh, availability. Uh, mm -hmm. The now service or reduction of infrastructure resilience is, uh, is, is really the one that has been voted uh, largely more than the others, as well as a loss of confidentiality uh, and information disclosure. This is also a very important topic. So um, again, thank, thanks a lot. Uh, we have um, another couple of polls here. Try to go quickly. Uh, here, um, uh, I'm sharing, uh, so you should see the third poll appearing. This is a little bit longer goes uh, through uh, different layers of uh, collab solution. Uh, there is a device layer, network layer, and cloud transaction layer, um, which we call in, uh, in collabs connected object, smart factory, and digital supply network. Um, um, let's say uh, we are we have organized the, the three. Uh, so we, we we're asking your feedback on the three layers on, on, on over three questions. The first question is how much research and innovation do you think is needed 
at this layer. So how much research and innovation at the device layer, at the network layer and cloud transaction layer. Uh, this means, let's say, low TRL um, uh, exploration uh, and more innovative solution. The second question that we are asking, how relevant and impactful do you consider the collab solutions presented so far? Of course, we haven't presented the whole of it, but let's say some, some uh, selected technologies. Um, uh, how do you consider them impactful uh, so far? Uh, this means that uh, we would like to understand, let's say, at different layers, what do you perceive to be uh, uh, the domain where there could be the highest impact in terms of cybersecurity of the whole uh, uh, collaborative manufacturing uh, infrastructure. The third question that we are asking for all the three layers is how feasible would be the deployment of collab solutions in this layer in existing manufacturing infrastructure. Uh, feasibility or let's say um, complexity uh, of deployment, I think is uh, very, a very important point. Clearly uh, manufacturing infrastructure owners and supply chain operators are very focused on keeping operations and, and, and let's say delivery at the, um, uh, the highest priority. Um, despite that, uh, let's say, uh, adoption of cybersecurity measures can be an enabler for, uh, for being ready in the, uh, say, to serve the customers in the supply chain. However, it's also uh, an, an investment. And we have seen from the invited speaker at the beginning, Professor Egbrian, and, uh, and also the other conversations that we had in the, in the event, how expensive or impactful can be this? So uh, understanding feasibility of the deployment is a very important aspect for us. Thanks a lot for voting. It's, uh, I, th I see there is a lot of participation to this. 50% uh, of uh, participation so far, uh, and, and I'll be happy to continue uh, to collect uh, your, your inputs. Um, Uh, in the meanwhile, if there's uh, questions to, to raise, uh, please uh, um, put them into the chat. Martin, I, I would be in favor of uh, closing the session now, if you agree, uh, and, uh, and share the results. Yeah, I think we have to go and honestly, I also don't know. We have until one o'clock. This is our kind of hard stop also from the organization point of view, but um, it would be good, Valeria, if we can close it for the moment. And maybe if the organization uh, leaves us to um, the Zoom channel open so far, maybe if there are some more feedback to come in or uh, some more questions, just feel free to use the chat also when this session is closed. Yeah. Yeah, and so uh, Ma Martin, what, what I see from the results is that uh, the device layer um, uh, seems to be characterized with a medium, let's say medium to high level of research. So there is perceived the need of uh, innovation and research in this area. Um, uh, and less uh, technology maturation. So probably needs that uh, say we are not ready for uh, mature technologies yet. Um, in terms of relevance and impact, uh, is, uh, is, there is a perceived a very high impact of these uh, layer solutions. Uh, it, it can be complex to um, ensure adoption and deployment of these technologies. My, my understanding could be that for sure, uh, there is a lot of legacy, uh, there are costs related to these um, let's say, new technologies introduction, introduction and so on, as well as uh, uh, compatibility issues. From the network layer, uh, um, uh, instead, uh, um, the, the, the area is perceived, uh, let's say, uh, more mature. Uh, I'm, 
I'm not uh, surprised by this result, even though research and technology transition is still uh, required as appropriate. It would be, uh, it's, it's uh, let's say, it's perceived as a medium re relevance uh, area uh, in terms of impacts in, impact in security, uh, medium to high, I would say. Um, and uh, in terms of uh, uh, deployment and adoption of new technologies at the network layer, uh, there is uh, ex equo results between uh, medium probability of friction and low probability of friction. So still they are perceived as uh, uh, op open for uh, so an opportunity to deploy and, and be adopted but uh, with more uh, questions on uh, how feasible and uh, how complex it would be to, to work in this domain. Concerning the cloud layer, uh, this is also uh, in transaction security part, this is also perceived as an area uh, of high innovation. Uh, honestly, I, 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 I recognize myself also in, this, uh, in these results. Um, uh, as well as, um, let's say, impactful. We know that infrastructures for manufacturing are moving much more to the paradigm uh, edge plus, pl plus cloud uh, architecture. So I think uh, this should be in line with this, uh, with this trend. And finally, feasibility and uh, adoption of this technology seems to be high in this area, also due to the, uh, let's say, transition to this kind of new um, new paradigms. So the last uh, uh, poll here, and sorry for taking a little, little longer, but it was uh, very good to collect your inputs, is about uh, uh, overall feedback on this event. And this, this event uh, is, has been uh, dedicated this year to, to collapse, uh, but in, in the future, we would like to uh, use it as, a, as an opportunity to share about the different security technologies on the industry for, for, for the uh, domain. And here I listed uh, a few areas that we have uh, put out in the uh, call for papers and call for uh, in expression of interest, let's say, and a, a few uh, evocative pictures here for those of you who are uncertain maybe on some of these areas. Um, yes, some of the questions, um, uh, let's say, relate to ICSAC event, especially, as well as uh, to the collabs event. Uh, if uh, you're interested in following up in the, into the project, if you would be uh, favorable to set up a mailing list uh, to reach out to some of these, uh, some of the participants and, and so on. Uh, and the last question uh, relates to uh, what are the expectations in terms of collapse uh, outcomes? What are the deliverables that you would be interested in to more? Uh, best practices and white papers on how to adopt the technologies in real industrial settings or uh, uh, building blocks, uh, uh, reusable building blocks, so technology that we have been able to mature and demonstrate. And uh, <coughs> experience from demonstration and feasibility, um, let's say, uh, of actual deployment in industrial environment. Um, okay. So, uh, there is, a, there is already a, a little, let's say, feedback on this. And thank you. So with this, I think, Martin, we are going to, to the closure of this uh, uh, polling session. Uh, I'll... Uh, I'll end this uh, last round of poll, share the results. <clears throat> Thank you um, for uh, positive feedback on the event, as well as uh, uh, in interest in uh, Collab's uh, project results.
um, uh, there is a very positive uh, feedback on the opportunity of having a mailing list that can inform uh, on, on, on the project results as, as we progress. So I think this is definitely something that we need to take as a homework to do uh, to increase the information shared outside. Martin, from your side, uh, you want to say uh, a few final words, uh, direction you, yeah, you, you think uh, we could take also maybe for collaboration with uh, Sequoia and, and having said those, uh, having seen the, the, their, their challenges and, and interesting work ongoing. Yeah, I can just um, add to what you said. So I really like today's sessions. You mentioned it was the first time um, the exact workshop was set up, but uh, my personal point of view, uh, just as also someone participating and listening to the other presentations, that was really uh, very helpful also to get the input also, for example, from the side of Matthias on Sikai, what you are doing in um, labor projects, so to say, and uh, Valeria, as you mentioned, uh, would also be good to keep up um, the exchange in the future. And also in particular, thanks to the industrial panelists about um, what are the requirements today. So also so what you just brought up in the beginning, that also helps us to, to map what we are doing in the context of collabs to today's requirement and to um, accommodate the solutions we are working on in, in this regard. So maybe Valerio, it's okay for you, we can still keep it up for some, apart from the poll. And once again, thanks a lot for everyone participating in this poll. If there are any further questions, any feedback, which has not yet been addressed by the polls as such, just feel free to use the, uh, chat right now, or um, also as mentioned during the um, presentations, if something comes up in your mind and you want to reach out to us, just feel free to do so. Uh, I think all the information has been shared in particular concerning call-ups, uh, where and how to, to reach us. So maybe just from my uh, side and um, a suggestion if there are any immediate questions, any immediate feedback in addition, please. Uh, someone already did it so far, but please put it in the uh, chat and then we can pick it, pick it up if okay for you. Thanks, Martin. Uh, my side also, there is a lot of op opportunity to link also to Sequoia uh, and um, I'll make sure maybe to set up a more uh, deeper conversation with them. Um, all the conversation related to the different forms of collaboration, it's very interesting as it provides um, a good uh, positioning and uh, mindset to reason on the different uh, aspects of collaboration, which is uh, an enabler, but it is also always an entry point for uh, additional threats. So it uh, enlarges the uh, attack surface of an organization. So I think uh, 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 this is very this is very interesting domain, uh, and um, um, we'll understand with the organizers of uh, Hypic if it would be possible to send. Uh, on, uh, let's say an email. We won't be, let's say, won't be, let's say, uh, having uh, participants' address, but we can ask uh, the organizers to uh, forward an email to uh, give you uh, the opportunity to keep in touch. And if you are interested, can can uh, let's express the, the your your availability to be uh, registered to some form of mailing list to the project. So. Uh, I'll, I'll check out what can be done in a privacy sensitive manner uh, with the organizers. Uh, 
and I think this, uh, Martin, this uh, closes the session. We have been asked to be uh, quite um, uh, precise with, uh, with timing. So thanks a lot for the speakers, to the speakers. Thanks to the participants uh, of this uh, interesting session.